This week on Tales of Tyria, there's not a whole lot of news, so instead we tie Freelancer in a chair and make him tell us everything there is to know about the auction house, about trading, about making money, I need it! Coming right up. All right, welcome one, welcome all, welcome to another exciting episode of Tales of Tyria right here on the Sound Strategy Network. We are almost live from the um, undisclosed, undisclosed location here in Lion's Arch. It's it's somewhere very important, I'll let you know that. So, uh, we're glad you got a hold of the program, however you may have found it. Tell a friend or two, won't you? And uh, let me introduce everybody we've got on the table here. And by the way, I was lying. Freelancer's actually here of his own free will, so let's not, let's not make him mad. Hello, Freelancer, welcome. <laughs> You called it an auction house. How could you? I did. It slipped. It was. Like, I, I only you did. already ruined this whole show by calling it an auction house. I am ashamed of you. I sir. only get one take on the live shows, all right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not my fault. Also, all with right. us, Kai. Kai. What is that? <laughs> you got papers over there? You're shuffling around? I'm getting my notepad. I need money. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how you do spreadsheets, Kai. That's not how it works. All right, so uh, Vega has the night off today. Uh, so we are flying as a trio, and let me tell you, it is... Um it's lonely. I'm so alone. All right, so we are first going to give a quick thanks to Mitchell, Zachary, and Nicholas for donating this past week. Uh, the show does have some expenses, including the hosting of the website and the hosting of the audio files, and uh, plus all of the other things like the green screen and the lights. And Okay, thank you guys very much. You take some of the financial burden off of me, which helps me spend a little bit more time working on the show, and I hope it makes it better. So... With that having been said, one more thing I want to remind everybody, feedback at talesofteria.com is the website where you can send us, is the website, is the email address, is where you can send us information. Also, you can follow us on Twitter at Tales of Tyria. Let's jump right into the news stories this week. So, this is something uh, that got sent to us and actually has seen some improvements even since the last time I loaded it. It is a new website called gil gw2guilds.org, and the purpose of the site is basically to have sort of a list of all the guilds and sort of act as a uh, database as well as I think a recruiting tool potentially uh, uh, so that you can look up you know where are the various alliances what servers contain what guilds how many guilds are on each server what the size of the guilds are etc so this seems like a really cool site it's sort of in its very basic form it only is just recently launched you can filter by server say okay I want to see all the guilds on Jade Quarry and there you go all the guilds that people have put in Jade Quarry right there in front of you so if you oh I met this great guy he wanted to recruit me into this guild when I was guesting on this other server, but I can't remember what... Bam, there you go. You can look it up right here on gw2guilds.org. Freelancer, I think you are offering to help out with this project. Yeah, I am actually helping out now. Um, I'm sort of the guy that prevents the trolling. So uh, the guy that's running it uh, is incredible, the amount of work and the coding he's putting into this. There's all sorts of features that he's planning on doing. There's features already input, so like right now... Um, you know the alliance feature is is under uh, under construction, but there's also an update feature which I believe you're going over now that'll actually show you when guilds change and stuff. Mm -hmm. And just the the power of this because it's so sim you know you see how simple the interface is you know yeah. it's easy for anybody to pick it up. You don't have to go through a forum. You don't have to uh, deal with the e peen of people bumping their post twenty five thousand times. You know. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't have to deal with any of that. This is a very clean interface that you can browse the guilds. You can browse, you know, what kind of guild you want to be aiming for, PvP, what have you. And also sort it by servers. You know, as a guild leader, you can also look at this and get an idea of who your uh, comrades are. You know? It's cool as well. It's like color coded, so you can select if you're like casual, oh, semi hardcore, wow. or hardcore as well. So it's like red for hardcore, orange for semi hardcore, and green for casual, I think. So not only can you see it by PVE, PVP, and PVX, you can also oh. see it by how hardcore they are as well, which is cool. 
And he's got little pop-ups here to help you tell that. I love it when they do that to make these, you know, because they don't yeah, have that tips. written anywhere else. I love tooltips, yeah, which you don't see yeah. in uh, in web pages all that often, but it's really awesome that it's there. Languages, I mean, yeah, this does have everything. Like if, okay, I need to find, you know, the only Brazilian <laughs> guild that's on this page here. So you can filter by by the all the kind of things. Also, size. It's very important to, like, okay, I don't want to join a big guild. I would like a small, tight-knit guild of about 20 to 30 people. That helps you look through it here as well. And as I saw before, it looks like you can click on them. You get some information. The website, uh, whether recruitment is open or closed. There's there's a lot of room for growth here. So it's a very cool website. Thought I'd mention it. So if anybody out there has your has your guild and uh, it has not been put on here, now you now is a place where you can ah oh, yes, we are important enough to go on that website. <laughs> yeah, and it's superior to like that Titan Pad and the Guru thread that was going around because of the fact that it, it's. You update your own guilds. You don't have to rely on other people to update the OP, and you don't have to worry about people wiping out the public notepad, which happens so many times. Yeah. Um, yeah, we had so many trolls from 4chan and stuff that went to the notepad, like this Reddit notepad that everybody was using, and wiped it all out. So this prevents all of that. You can go there. You don't have to worry about it, and you can do some research. Excellent. But research is always good. So. Yeah, and there's, there's there's certainly been people asking me, like, okay, so I, I don't really want to join Team Legacy. It's not that hardcore. Where's the list of guilds that I can find? Do you have any recommendations? And I'm just like, the, go to the Guru Threads, maybe? So this is it's good to have someplace yeah. else to uh, to point people to. So uh, he may or may not be looking for help, but I would love to see this site sort of flourish into the main place you go to look for guild information, to look for anything. So, so that's really awesome. The next thing on the list here is another sort of guild initiative to sort of help out people and this is uh what has been uh, dubbed the play date i'm not sure i appreciate that that's sort of a weird name with a different kind of connotation but uh what the idea here is if you are looking for a guild or your guild is looking for members you go to this team speak and basically they're going to try and organize guild recruiters to sort of speed date style almost have two or three people just go play a game with them, be it TF2, League of Legends, Tribes, you know, assumingly there's a bunch of different things since we can't play Guild Wars 2 right now. Um, and you spend a couple, uh, like an hour or so, maybe 20 minutes, I don't know exactly how long it's going to be, but um, the, everybody gets to play a little bit together and then afterwards the recruiters and them can exchange information and decide where they wanted to go with this play date uh it's kind of an interesting concept um so definitely check out the link that's in the show notes it's happening to every monday and tuesday supposedly from 5 45 to 10 15 uh that is pacific daylight time as of right now so that is actually going to be at 8 45 to uh 1 a 1 15 a.m if you're on the eastern seaboard is what that time schedule will be as far as i can tell here so that is kind of cool uh, he's got a Frag World uh, actually donated a, a TeamSpeak server to help out with that. So there's also going to be some streaming and a whole bunch of good times. So check out the link in the show notes, guys, if you want to take part in that. Again, the show notes you can find right on the Tales of Tyria website, which is talesoftyria.com. Just look for episode number 42. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, check it out in the, the, the description down below there. Uh, and you'll find the show notes right there. Now, let's go on to... The Roundtable, ladies and gentlemen. This is what everybody's been waiting for, what everybody has been asking for every week. Again, when are you going to do that economy video where you tell me how to make lots of money really easily? <laughs> uh, and, and it's not quite that simple, but we're going to get there. So there's a lot of different facets to the whole economy in Guild Wars 2. And if you're completely unfamiliar with the whole thing... Uh, there is a, uh, a video that I've made called, it's a little bit out of date, but it's almost mostly 95% of it is still pretty accurate in terms of the entire economy of the game and the different types of currencies that you can get. So that's a great starting place if you haven't actually uh, looked into the game at all before. But what we're going to approach this from is, okay, from a more casual perspective, if you just want to not lose a lot of money to, to, to people like Freelancer, <laughs> because you want to know how to actually get your money's worth for the things that you're picking up in the game. You don't have a lot of time to spend. You're not going to be sitting on the auction house. I, I did it again! The trading post. So, you're, you don't want to dedicate time to that. You just want to make sure you get your money's worth when yeah. you do trade a little and it bit. Should be, it should be noted that, uh, those of you watching this video, if you're watching it later on YouTube. Um, you know, a lot of this stuff is going to change. Uh, I'm, ArenaNet is watching this podcast right now. <laughs> <laughs> they figured out our they secret are, yeah. formula. Uh, Quick. Yeah, you know, I, a lot of these are possible that they, they may change. Um, you know, I'm 
I'm, you know, I figure what do I have to lose? So it's uh, keep in mind that we're going to mainly hit on the main points, like the, the psychology behind the trading post, because, yes, there is a whole feature there. Um, not so much the actual values of items, you know, specific, you know, right. coppers worth this much three hours into the game. I can tell you how bad <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how bad it is. I can tell you coppers. 13 is going to be worth 13 uh, a copper ore is going to be worth 13 copper two hours into the game give or take three copper but that's not what we're going to go into right uh, it's, it's, it's going to be more so that yeah we're going to go so more so into the idea of it. all right and we also want to talk about you know not only the people that just okay how do i get the most out of it while i'm leveling but also the people that want to be like freelancer and stand in front of the aux- the, the trading post for four hours man i gotta b- break that habit um, but we're also going to talk a little bit about day one. You know, what, what's the best thing to do on the first day and the different types of ways? Because there's actually a lot of different ways to make money in the game. You can, you can farm, you can trade, you can buy low, sell high, which is apparently wrong according to Freelancer. We'll find out why. Let's well, jump right into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you buy high, sell low, but we'll go into that later. All right, so let's start with just normal leveling. This is the casual person's casual person. This is what everybody should be doing in the game. What kind of tips would we give to them? First of all, gather all the things. I mean, that's clearly you want to have as much stuff as possible to to sell on the trading post, right? I mean, that can't possibly go wrong. Uh, Okay, well, are we talking about gathering everything like... You know, you see a node on your mini map and you go run and gather it because if that's the the idea that you're pushing here, Bridger, I'm going to be the anti-Bridger group that says, don't do that. You know, you're wasting your time. Uh, You don't want to gather everything. That's the biggest mistake everybody can make because if you waste your time following those little symbols on your mini map uh, gathering, you're, you're essentially not gaining experience. You're not killing mobs. You're not getting the fine materials from mobs. You're not, you're not doing all these amount of things that will get you to the next tier of items. So, should you gather trees and stuff that you come across? Of course. Um, you know, but that's the thing with, with trees and, and copper ore and stuff. I get asked a lot, you know, there seems to be more ore in the world than there are, uh, you know, logs and stuff. Why are the prices of logs always at five copper or six, co- uh, six copper for green logs? Well, you know, all of you guys listening, think about this a second. When you're questing, when you're doing uh, public events, whatever it might be, what do you always happen to run into in the middle of that field killing mobs? And when you consider that and you consider the volume of everybody gathering that same thing, which is trees and herbs, um, that is where you have that flux, that, that market flux. And that is always why, if you, if you look at the price of ore and such, that you it's used just as much as logs for weaponsmithing, for all sorts of different things. Um, but it's, it's always a higher price, and that's because of the fact that you as a player have to actually go around your normal objective skirt along the mountain we all know it it's not any too much different from wow either and mine and specifically go out of your way to mine those things that's why they're always uh worth more so why should you why shouldn't you actually go along that mountain and skirt and get all that copper ore well because the time you're wasting doing that and actually going to get that copper ore could have been better spent killing six wolves which would have given you thin blood or it could have been spent leveling up or you could have started the next public event and before, if you, if you take all that time spent on the copper ore you just mined versus the getting the next level and therefore moving to the next tier of ore and next tier of logs, you would make more money cumulatively than if you had just wasted your time mining those, that ore and such around that side of the map. That is my philosophy, Bridger. Now, to, to put an anecdote to that, to sort of, uh, is while I was in beta weekend number three, I was playing with, what was it? It was weaponsmithing or armorsmithing, one of those. And I found that I was never limited really by the amount of copper or wood that I had. It was always those what what they call trophies, but I don't think they call them trophies in Beta Weekend. They call them fine, fine materials. Fine materials now is what they call them. So I was always limited by those things, like you said, like the, the thin, the vial of thin blood or the tiny totems or whatever, those tiny little things. Basically the <laughs> magical essences basic, that right. you put into weapons and, and armor and things like that. Those were always a limiting level. factor. Right. At the base level, you know, if, if you look at the prices, I think, when you, when you went to the trading post and you went to go buy, uh, let's say, a claw or a fang versus uh, a, some blood, blood was always, blood and let's say scales were always outrageously uh, 10, 20 times the price of fangs and claws. Why do you think that was, Bridger? Uh, I think blood and scales were the first tier. No, blood and scales were... 
vitality and everybody wanted health? Well, it was along the lines that scales, yes, are for mainly vitality and blood is mainly for power and precision. And that alone, you know, to create berserker gear or to create, you know, the whole precision power idea, that is blood. The items you create via your armor and your weapons is used via blood. Um, every specific trophy, there's fangs, there's claws, there's blood, there's scales, there's venom, there's bones, and I think Magic I got dust of some kind? For the right, yeah. There, yeah, you've got uh, so, dust to transmute gems and so, aquatic gems. So for all of you out there, these actually all fulfill a, a specific trait. So when you look at the typical gamer, they want to do damage when they're leveling up. They want to do, they just want to go past that quest and, you know, they typically will never find themselves in a situation that requires extra vitality or extra, you know, anything else, but just pure damage. They want to be able to get through that content as fast as they can, get to the next storyline piece, whatever it might be. So blood is obviously the best way to do that. It gives you power and precision to whatever you create with blood. Therefore, when you're looking at the different types of uh, fine materials, blood will always be up on that on that list. Uh, scales, vitality, you know, is the same concept. But you have a whole other uh, factor here, Bridger, and that is where are these things dropped from? You know, every one of these fine materials are dropped from a specific type of mop. So uh, scales are typically dropped from like. Uh, you know, armored turtles and and uh, amphibious and crates types and, creatures. Ex exactly. You know, where you typically have to jump into the water and kill them. Now, because most players avoid water, like it, and that's just fact. Most players will avoid water and fight on land to do public events and stuff. You naturally have a lack of scales on the market at all times. So you again, you fall back into the rhythm of if I'm a player that wants to be tanky and do damage, so I want power, vitality, and maybe another stat. I want scales for whenever I'm crafting. Well, scales are always going to be on the low end, and they're always going to be obscenely priced. So I, I people that complain nonstop about, you know, oh, scales and blood are, are so expensive, they're 20 copper a piece and stuff, they don't understand that it's just as easy to farm them as other things. You just have to go in the right places where normal people don't go. So if you're, if you're crafting, just, if you're trying to level up your crafting, it might be better to buy those cheaper things like the totems or something like go. that so, because all you need to do is level it up. You don't care about the outcome necessarily. Yep. So going back to the original point, when you're leveling up and you're going through doing your questing, the reason you want to chop the logs is because there's no reason not to. They're right there in front of you. They will not provide you any income, uh, not nothing notable anyway. Six copper piece for green logs. You do and, sometimes get those little gemstones from them, like amber pebbles and things. Those can provide not you Not from logs. Pebbles. Now, from log, from trees and logs, you, uh, you're typically going to get the hidden stashes, which can contain cloth and all sorts of little random things in it. That's the proc chance for log, for trees. So, mm -hmm. like with uh, or the proc chance for that with a better pick, you know, or, or one of those mystic picks, you get the chance of getting gemstones, right? With uh, logs, you find these little hidden stash things, which are little baggies that drop, and you open them and it gives you like a random set of items. But the idea is that when you're leveling up, sure, you know, craft what you can, get your dailies, which you know you have to harvest, I think, 20 things a day. Mm -hmm. You know, get your dailies knocked out via knocking out the trees and stuff, but don't waste your time circumventing all the copper ore and such when you're going to be moving up to the next tiers and stuff. Because when you are in that next tier, you spent that time leveling up. It, I'm not talking about rushing. I'm not talking about min-maxing and, and ruining the game experience. But I'm just talking about when you get to that next tier, you're going to be when, mindful. By, when you tier, you mean crafting materials tier? Is that the idea, the next right. tier of so crafting tiers materials? Into, Talk about that. Levels. Yeah, so level zones basically contain a, a tier. And this is a term I use. This isn't like a universal term. But all my spreadsheets split into six tiers. So tiers would be... Uh, split down crafting, and then you have levels. So every item has a level and then a tier level. Uh, so a tier three blood is just is called blood. A, uh, a tier two blood is thin blood. So, you know, a tier one blood is weak blood. Now, the way that is used is also has its own level. So, um, and that goes way into stuff I'm not going to really cover. But the, the easiest way to visualize this is if you guys have ever seen all the different types of gathering tools, each gathering tool gathers a new tier. So the, yeah. the rough harvesting sickle or the rough logging axe that you get at the very beginning of the game, you can use that from level one. It'll only gather copper or the first, what is it, green wood logs. Then if you yeah. want to gather the next tier, which is iron, for example, for the, for the, iron, for the ores, if you want to gather iron, Iron ore and silver ore, you need an iron mining pick. After that, you get a steel mining pick to get gold ore. I'm just reading this off of Wiki, of yeah. the Guild Wars now, 2 Wiki. So that's the six tiers. tiers. Though, it's 
It's typically when you're looking at the zones, the 1 to 15 zones are considered tier 1. There is a very low chance uh, that you'll find a tier 2 like wood, you know, tree there that will give you, uh, I guess it would be soft wood. Soft wood, wood, I soft think, wood yeah. thank you. So tier 2 wood, soft wood, you know, that's a chance. Now, when you get to the level 15 to 25 zone, you know, you're, you're essentially mining tier 2 items, but the arena net conveniently mixes in tier 1 and tier 3 into the tier 2 zone. So when you're running around a 15 to 25 zone, you're going to come across trees that give you uh, green wood. That, that's fine. But there's also going to be times that more consistently you're going to get tier 2 wood and such and so forth. Now, it should also be noted, Bridger, that if you don't have like a sufficient level or a sufficient tier of, a, of an axe or a, um, you know, whatever it might be, you can still mine it. And there is a very, very low chance you will still get the material. Did you know that? Ah, no, so, I knew that. I heard there was a get chance you get the well. gemstones. Yep. But you, there's also a chance, for example, if you're mining uh, gold ore with an iron mining pick, which normally just results in, like, ruined ore chunks. You're ruined saying there's a very chunks, small right? chance you can also wind up with gold ore? We had, we had numerous, and then I had to see it for myself. We had numerous guild members that reported getting, like, out, you know, when they just did it for experience, because if you don't have a sufficient pick and you don't feel like porting back to town, you can still do it for at least the experience. Mm-hmm. But it will also give you a ruined, you know, log or a ruined ore chunk. But every so often, they got like a piece of gold ore or you know, a piece of iron ore, um, or not iron, iron silver ore. So you know, it doesn't mean you should do it. You should always leave home with some extra picks and stuff. But um, it is worth noting that just because you see it and you don't think you have the right level. Chop it down anyway. It does give these an experience, and it goes towards your achievement tracks as well. And you might get something that you shouldn't even have yet. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so uh, so let's see. What's next on the list here? So that is very interesting. So definitely a good tip for anybody who's, who's sort of listening to this for the first time. Uh, when you first get into the game, you're going to want to grab those rough tools. And that way, like Freelance just said, as you're walk- going around, if you just come across a node... Go ahead and take care of it. Get the stuff because especially at the very beginning of the game, there are going to be a ton of people that want those crafting materials. So even if you have no interest in crafting at all, just go and buy a log, chop it down. Go and buy a mining node, grab some of that ore. Hey, those potatoes look delicious, but you're not going to eat them, so sell them to somebody else. There you go. Now, here's another question. Now, this is for normal leveling. We all know about the, the salvaging kits. Now, loot drops sometimes give you salvage items, but you're also like, okay, I've got this chess piece that I can't use. Now, I've got different levels of salvaging kits. i got the basic salvaging kit that's really only going to give me the ore, some of the ore that, was, that, the, that the chess piece was made with, for example. Um, but you've got these higher level salvaging kits that say they have a higher chance of giving you higher level materials and some of them have a higher chance of recovering the the gem the runes or the sigils or the gemstones that were in them uh do you think those are worthwhile should you buy the more expensive salvaging kits and use them for say uh masterwork or higher items okay let me give you a little insider info here on on one of the biggest ways i make money when you look at the psychology of the way players buy materials off the market, and we're talking, we're, I'll go back to salvage thing because this leads into that. Um, and you think about let's let's go back to WoW or go back to any previous game that had markets, you know, like an auction house system. Players typically make the decision from the get go to mass farm items. So everybody from the get go, going back to the copper idea, is going to mass farm copper. Copper will be at an all time low for the first week or so. That's why I always tell you guys, and I tell my guild members. Don't go out of your way to mine copper because it's going to be dirt cheap at the auction house now or the trading post. I just did it. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But all right. So now you're looking at this. Most players, when they get to crafting, they're going to it's not going to be a craft like level one to twenty five thing. It's not going to be a craft level one to fifty thing. When a player typically decides to sit down and start crafting, it's something that engrosses them. They they want to keep doing it and they will go to the market to buy more more materials now. Because there is such a massive influx of iron and copper and, and softwood and greenwood, those will be available for them. They will continue crafting nonstop and getting those tiny things and those small things and, and the thin bloods and small bloods uh, nonstop until they have their crafting at a certain level. Now, this is where things break off. When they reach a certain mid-level, every game has this. Uh, I call it the tertiary level because it's you will find the most expensive items there aside from the highest tier items. Typically, in I call this tier four, tier five. These are your money makers. Okay, these are the areas where people are getting to about level forty to fifty. They are 
at that point now where they're not really excited about gathering materials anymore, you know, they just want, you know, players get to this mindset. I'm being real here. Players get to this mindset when they start hitting level 50 or 60 that they, they love the game. They enjoy the game, but they, they're just waiting to get to 80. You know, they just want to get to 80 at this point, you know, now they want to see the max level content. They want to have all their skills out there. They, they want to do all that. So they, they typically rush. The leveling line, the, the the progress from around level 40 to 50 to 80 is always faster than players that go from 1 to 40. Now, the, the idea, the mentality behind that is the crafting materials at those tiers, while they're just as plentiful, Bridger, uh, out there in the world but from levels 40 to 50, they're not going to spend their time going out and crafting them. So you as a craft, you as a uh, as a, somebody doing a profession, when you start looking at the market for tier 4, tier 5 items, they're outrageously priced, you know. Uh, just tier 3 items, if you looked in the BWE3, the, the, the few tier 3 items that were out there were m multiples of, of 8, 10, some of them 20 gold even. Uh, blood in itself, tier 3 blood, mm -hmm. was running for about 18 silver at the end of BWE3. And that was stuff Th that was, that was you know, level 25 easily. grabbable, so yeah. it's not stuff that yeah. was outside of the beta, really. Right, so what you had here in, in that controlled environment was players that were basically power leveling for the, the EP and the saying they were this XX and, you know, level. They were not gathering those materials just to gather them and level up. It just happened to be things they came across. So those materials were extremely rare. Now, the same thing applies in live, and I'm, I'm talking to everybody here. When you get into the game, you're going to notice the same thing. If, if you're one of those guys that wants to spend some time leveling up crafting, which, by the way, Bridger, how many levels do you think we could get off of crafting like in one session? It was pretty good, right? Like two, three levels? Yeah, off if you, of a, if a you good crafting it, session. Yeah, if you it basically what what I found is uh, I think in the beta beacon number two, one and two, I had two characters, and one character I didn't really do any crafting on. I just leveled him up, and he got up to about twenty five or something. The other one I sort of went around and played around with, and I decided to try some crafting. So I had two characters worth of tier one items. So I was able to shoot right through tier one and jump up into tier two, and I think I got at least two to three levels uh, going up into tier two and beyond. Okay. So getting back, you know, without beating around a bush too much here, it, the idea is that tier three, tier four, around that midline is always the, the second most expensive items you'll find in the game. If you guys think back to WoW, and I'm, I'm not going to really go into it, but what was always the most expensive items in WoW? Mage Weave, Silk Club, yeah. you know, at, at, at all times. You know, most people are just like, well, I don't understand. It drops less. No, it doesn't drop less. And it was those same people that, you know, I had to educate, you know, on the way drop tables and stuff where Blizzard didn't intentionally make those drop less or more. They dropped just the same as, you know, linen and wool. Players are spending but, less time in those areas and so there's you less so, created. Exactly. So by a certain point, those players reach that that, break, that that cliff, I call it, you know, where at this point they're, they're done enjoying the game as far as immersiveness and, and such. But the mass majority will start making that decision right then and there. That they want to get 80. They want to reach that level and start, you know, hardcore stomping noobs or, or whatever your your gist is. You know, you want to have access to the full game because you're level 80. So there's a level where they stop really aiming to those materials. So you want to make money in Guild Wars 2. Tip number one. Well, we're going to go over a few other a few tips through this episode. Tip number one: If you want to balance out the market and make mass amounts of money when you get level 50, 60. I know you're going to be kind of worn out. You've been leveling for three, four days straight. I know I will be. I'll be wired on energy drinks. <laughs> but that's the time that you really need to start crafting. Uh, I'm sorry, not crafting, gathering. Because there will be such a demand for those players that are sitting in Lion's Arch, mass buying off the market, and then they get to that Tier 4, Tier 5 level with their crafting. And, and they go, the, I need to craft more, but I have yeah. no money, and these are expensive. Where's my wallet? I need gems. This is the <laughs> only answer <laughs> that I can think of, and you I think that'll be... happen. Like, that's the, the thing I was thinking in my head. Well, okay, but if nobody has any money because they're spending it all on the crafting materials in Tier 1 and Tier 3, nobody's going to buy the Tier 3, and then it hits me. Aha! The gem conversion. So that'll definitely help spark a lot of things. So now here's the question. Now, I as a player am thinking to myself every time I'm gathering stuff, I'm like, well, I'm going to want to use all this in crafting, so I can't sell any of it. You know, i gotta, I got to hold on to all of it. I've got to hoard it. I can't sell it because I'm going to need this later, and I don't want to have to sell it for this, something and then buy it back for something more expensive later. Uh, is that sort of a, a common mentality you think everybody's going to have, Kai? Is that, is that how you feel normally, or do you feel like just sell it all? 
Um, I'm not sure. In previous games, I'm one of those people that literally just sells everything and then buys it back again when I need it. But in Guild Wars 2, because you can level so many characters and have all of the crafting professions, I feel like I'm going to hoard all of it and not sell anything. And then I'm going to be like, wait, but then I don't have my gold so i'm i'm gonna learn as much from this episode as everyone watching i think in regards to what i should sell and what i should keep and i'm just completely baffled by it all to be honest okay so then uh that that sort of mentality i wonder if 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 that's a bad thing to have from this point of view so i mean because what freelancer suggesting here is basically once you get to that level 50 part you're going to make a mint trying to sell those tier three tier four or tier five items to people yep. and then you can use that money to buy the stuff cheaper later as the wave of people moves into that range because most of them are going to be behind you but what happens if you're in that range uh does that change what you should do freelancer if you're like not the hardcore person that gets there first. What if you come later? Well, it, it's still though you're you're still running into that that psychology of most people getting to that point, Bridger, are going to want to rush to eighty. Okay. So you're you can still be that guy that gets those materials and stuff because there will always every single you got to think of it like this when you're at that tier four you know node. There's always somebody that's about to buy that from you you know, when you get to that level because there's such a demand. Mm -hmm. Whereas in lower tiers, you know, copper, iron and stuff, it's, you don't have that feeling nor is there that demand because it's always on the market. You know, there's there's always, you know, mass amounts of it. So you, it's never really a rush for that. You're not really competing at that point and there's not a large profit margin on copper and iron. Whereas with these tier four, tier five materials that typically people will skip over while leveling, there's a very large margin for that because there's a high demand for that. Now, people, players aren't going to notice this immediately. Like, a lot of my spreadsheets have graphs that show the way, you know, how many hours into launch and second day and stuff, how these prices adjusted on BWE 1, 2, and 3, so I can compare the charts. A lot of the trends are about, I'm looking at me here now, a lot of the trends are about the same. So I'll give you an example, like with copper, okay? Copper, iron, and then silver, which silver is actually a different profession, but it still sort of runs with it. Mm -hmm. Copper will always, right from the get-go, start at obscene prices. The reason being is because there's always that little, you know, I'm going to be very careful with my word. There's always that guy that's trying to rip everybody off. So he will typically see the markets relatively empty. He will mass buy out everything on the, on the market before, you know, more and more people get things on there. And he'll sell it for obscene amounts of price, or copper, or whatever it is. So that's always how the, everything starts. So, like, all my charts start copper ore at about 35 copper Per, per ore. That's that's insane, right? Yeah. So it always starts that way. About an hour into it, that's when the population, the players, uh, they they basically fight back. People <laughs> under this, you know, they you know they uh, they undercut him, they undercut him, they undercut him, and then it gets down to a reasonable level, to the point where people are, are earning more money via questing to pay for that copper uh, to counteract the people you know undercutting each other. So it always balances out between you know thirteen or so copper. Now. All players at the start of a game are going to rush questing. You know, they're going to go out there, they're going to want to level, 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 because even if you're not somebody trying to min-max and, and rush to 80, which most players are not, um, you still want to get out there. You want to experience the same thing with your friends, and you're not going to be crafting unless you're some hermit and you exchanged <laughs> all your gems for, for gold or something. But typically everybody's going to be out there. So copper ore and iron ore and basic logs, just basic materials in general, start mass accumulating on the market. The prices go skyrocketing down, all right, because nobody's buying them. Nobody's ready to craft yet. Nobody's able to sit down and start doing that, okay? So about six hours into the game, one day into the game, and, and this is crunch time for you guys. This is tip number two, making money, how I made a lot of my money, is at that moment, you know, you need to be ready via however means of income you can get it. For, for me, obviously, I had a lot of buying power and a lot of Team Legacy members helping contribute money. But you need to take that moment to buy as much of that as you can. Consider it like a stock market. The I trade stock. You're talking about when it hits rock bottom at that first. Well, a lot of the a lot of the basic mats. Okay? okay. Because at that point, nobody's really ready to craft yet, and those mats are just overflowing the market. You have so much, you know, sell orders but no buy orders. So, so basically, um, the, right. the the rule here is pay attention. So just to like get my head around this. So just like 
break it down. So we get into the game, everyone's mass leveling, everyone's collecting wood and you know copper and stuff like that. And what you're saying is that everyone's spamming it onto the auction house, trading post, because you can do that away from it, so you're still questing. And a, a day later, everyone should just buy it off it, accumulate it, so when all the other guys start leveling and they need the copper, then to resell it at a higher price. Is that the what you're breaking, saying? The breaking point for, for me was 5 a.m. in the morning the next day. That is when people started logging back into the game, whether it was uh, Oceanics getting ready to sign off, U.S. people signing off. The idea was like... I got a craft. Yeah, they, they start crafting mm. and tinkering around because then that initial rush is gone. The, the mentality of rush, 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 level, level, level is gone. So if you think about it, that's when most players are going to... Uh, start looking at crafting, they're going to start buying materials, they're going to say, oh, look at all this this money I got from, you know, questing and stuff, and stuff I sold over the day. Let's see what I can do with crafting, and then you're going to notice the market do the complete opposite. It flips. So, if you were the guy that bought that mass amounts of load, as much as you can get it, you know, not everybody's going to have the same buying power, but if you can get a lot of that, that price is going to go back up. The median price, for example, for BWE3 was 14 copper. On the first day, Bridge or Kai, uh, copper sat at about seven. Uh, copper ore sat at about seven copper throughout the entire night, and it stayed there. The very next morning, it jumped to about fifteen copper, and then bounced around fifteen to thirteen copper the entire rest of the stuff. So, the point of all of this is that there is a methodology, met methodology, however you want to pronounce that. Sorry, tongue twister there. Um, there is a, there is a method to this. You can actually you know look at it like a stock market because. Uh, I trade stock in real life. The same applies to any anybody I'm speaking out there. If you trade stock in real life, you know, you know, companies rise and fall. Well, commodities rise and fall, and it is based more so not on just random, you know, chance. Most people pull up the trading post and they just see random things. They're, um, you know, they're. It's like, oh, you know, why is it twenty copper today? Oh, I guess you know, it just happened to go to twenty copper. No, not at all. There, there's there's going to be a real. It's it's all yes. going to be. To me, as far as I can think of, of a couple of really big factors that are going to affect the markets. A, yes. the game opens. Okay, that means you've got a massive number of players leveling up together, which really affects the different mats at the different tiers as they reach those tiers. Next, when everybody hits 80 and they're starting alts, bam, those that round of alts is going to be adding new materials to the market that weren't getting there before. Now, that might take a while after people hit 80 because they're probably not going to jump straight down to an alt, but there's going to be a sudden wave two, three, maybe four months into the game where all of a sudden those lower tier crafting materials get a little bit cheaper all across the board. So those kinds of big things. And then when an expansion comes out, tons of people come back to the game, start new now, characters, and everything happens again. Let's keep in mind, though, Bridger, going back into the the, the psychology of this that there is a difference between an expansion coming out and a lot of players coming back to a fresh game and players creating a new character mm -hmm. players creating a new character fall into that trap i talked about that level 50 to 70 trap you know where people rush 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 because if you're creating a new character you've seen those zones before you've crafted those material or you've gathered those materials typically and statistically players creating new characters are going to try to level a lot faster and blow through content faster than they did before it doesn't matter what kind of player you are because so, you've seen those those beginner areas, you, you're basically you're you're rushing to each storyline. Because you know we know in Guild Wars 2 that storylines and such are going to be a lot different. You can have a lot of fun creating a new character, but the basic part of the game of any MMO, which is going out there killing random mobs, great, you know, gathering things, is going to be the same. And those players will typically rush faster through it. So what you see over time, like you do in in WoW or or Aeon or any game, it's, it's never it never changes. Is Things start off, the lower tier mats always start off incredibly cheap over time. That, that never changes. But as the game progresses, as people evolve and, and characters get older and the market evolves, typically those items start going up in value because l less and less players are creating, you know, are playing one to ten zones. And less and less players are, are crafting or trying to gather those nodes. So that's also, you can, you can buy, you can mass buy items in two ways. You can do it immediately in, in a very high volume in market, which is if you have the money, you will make money. End of story. If you buy the copper and stuff in the first eight hours, you're going to make double or triple your profit. I did, easily. And that's that. But you can also think long term. You can think that, okay, well, what if, I, what if I'm a guild leader, if I run a guild? And, you know, I, we just have an excess of copper and iron, et cetera. 
Well, I, you can still amass those items and then three, four months down the road, whereas before that copper was worth 13 copper a piece, it's going to, it will guarantee go up to 20, 22, 25 copper down the road. So there's two ways you can invest in that. So now uh, Z Carrot in the chat asks a pretty interesting question. Is there a time of day when you should buy versus a time of day when you should sell? Like I'm thinking people get home from work, they're logging in for the first time during you know a weeknight or whatever. Maybe one of the first things they do is they look at their inventory and go, ah, I got to get rid of some of this stuff before I go out for the day. You know, maybe I'm going to go sell it. So maybe that's the time to put out buy orders uh, when, when people are going to sell their yeah. stuff. Is there anything like that? You know, Bridger, I kind of answered that perfectly um, in WoW because typically servers in WoW are U.S. only. We we have one variable that is, you know, on, on my spreadsheet, one variable that we that, that catches everybody off guard. And everybody, you know, admits to this, whether it's worldly world or otherwise. Can you guess what that variable is? Global marketplace. No. No. Uh... No. We're talking about time of day to sell things. What do you think is the variable that makes this MMO a lot different than others? Is that you've got two, well multiple time zones on one server because everyone can play everywhere so people can be getting home from work you at have, four different times of the day oceanics o oceanic clerics um see we're, we're in a unique environment here whereas normally in wow um players typically rated from about 8 to 10 p.m maybe 11 p.m maybe 12 midnight and the idea the idea for players in wow was after their rating you know they looked at their numbers they looked at their stats some of them a little more so than others <laughs> and and they said you know what, what, can, what can I possibly buy on the market or what, what can I go look to see if I can improve my numbers? So the biggest time for buying, like the, the, mar the buying market was always right after midnight or around midnight. So as far as somebody wanted to make a quick buck, you know, <laughs> I would always list my items for higher than normal prices around midnight on purpose, knowing that there are players there that have to go to sleep, that have to go to work the next morning, have to go to school, whatever. They don't have a lot of time to go looking. If, they, if I have the item they want, they're willing to give some leniency to the price differential. So going back to that and, and Guild Wars 2, the, that little you know, midway, midnight section is not so much there because at the same time that U.S. players are logging off, Oceanic players are logging on. And it doesn't matter what kind of server you on, whether your server has a ton of Oceanics or not, because this is a global market. And now, that's a good question. Uh, is global right. meaning between the U.S. region and the EU region all share the same one, or is EU have its own separate market and the U.S. has its own separate market? Do we know that? I uh, I honestly don't know that. I, I don't. I Chat room has that been officially one. announced? I thought it was just one too. I never I think it's heard that they were separated. I always thought that they were the same. I'm pretty yeah. sure that it's just one trading post for Since the entire game. Everything else seems so fluid. I'm pretty sure it's just one global trading post. So even mm -hmm. with that knowledge, even if you count, uh, like you said, even if they were two separate ones, on the U.S. servers, we're going to have Oceanics. Maybe EU will have some kind of thing if they're separated. But I, like I said, I think they are closed uh, cl right. uh, together. Now, there are other, other variables that you, that you are sort of out of your control but are in your control that you can manipulate the market with. Now, one of them being the server downtimes okay um a big big uh thing that you could sort of ah. expect and plan for and acknowledge and manipulate is when a server is about to go down and when it comes up it, again when you as a player log on to the game you know bridger think about yourself logging on to bwe threat three now you don't immediately rush out to zones and start questing stuff typically you dabble around the trading post you look at your bank you know you do stuff like that but the key thing here is you looked at your trading post you looked at prices you maybe looked at your buy and sell order so viewership is a big big part of advertising you know just whether whether you drive down the highway and you plan on buying that ad or not the fact that more people looked at it means that more people are likely to buy it you know this is just basic market you know 101 so you can plan listing your orders especially if it's something you don't have an excess of like let's say it's a rare weapon or it's a um, it's an item that you want to flip quickly you don't want to put on the market for an extended period of time you want to make sure you sell it you can still statistically plan your sale, uh, your sale to happen quicker uh, during you know those times. So, question: Yeah, did you know you can double click on things and you don't have to drag them over every time? Uh, did you know it wasn't working for only? No. only <laughs> Dang it! I wanted to one-up freelancer. I'm it only works up. for your regular bank and not your guild bank. Uh, oh. 
you're listening, Arena Net, please fix that. Thank you. <laughs> I thought I caught you. Like, I found a way to be more efficient than Freelancer. But I'm just showing <laughs> Freelancer's stream here. This was the day Saturday, I think, you were, you were taking a bunch of, uh, a, a bunch of time to, uh, to go through the marketplace and stream what you were doing here. So I'm just going to have this playing in the background while you talk. Just want to give people a heads up what they're looking at here. So, you know, that, that's pretty much it on that point. I don't want to go too on, into one thing, but, you know, the idea is that their time is, is a very important thing. You can plan around certain events. You can, um, you can expect that in certain time zones, et cetera, that people are more apt to buy or more apt to sell. Now, in Guild Wars 2, you sort of have to plan that, unfortunately, around servers going down, server resets. World v. World resetting is a great one, Bridger. You know? yep. Those are all times that you can plan around. That Let's say you have been depositing all your collectibles in your bags all this time, and you don't have all the time in the world to consistently uh, you know, always check the trading post and always buy and sell. Well, that, those would be the times that you really want to plan on doing your buying and selling. Yes, absolutely. So brings us back to salvage kits. I think we asked a question about that <laughs> about an hour ago. What do you think about the higher level salvage kits? They cost a considerably bit more in terms mm -hmm. of coin. Uh, are they worth it uh, maybe for only higher level items or worth it at all? What I found when using it and um, just kind of when you're making gear, for example, or weapons, they kind of apply to the tiers, as freelancers spoke about, the tiers of um, crafting materials, it kind of applies to the tiers of gear. So if you're making a gear item that's in the first tier, there's no point using you know, a rare salvage kit because you're not going to get any better items. That's what I found anyway. So when you got kind of up the higher tiers of gear that you were making, that's kind of when you upgraded yourself to the higher salvage, like, salvage kits. The same with kind of mining nodes and things like that, like how you would upgrade your mining tools, you would upgrade your salvage kits as well. I don't know if freelance found anything different, but that's kind of what I noticed as I went along. Uh, but, you know, it really comes down to, like Guild Wars 1 uh, is the same concept there. You have to break down each salvage kit and divide it by the amount of uses to get the average copper, you know, per use. So when you're looking at salvage kits, like you take the master salvage kit, for example, Bridger, and you divide that by the 25 uses, I believe, that you get out of it. That's 60, I think 60 copper piece, if I did my math, mental math right there. So it's uh, 60 copper a piece means that everything you salvage, every item that you salvage, typically needs to be worth more than 60, 60 copper. The, the, basically, what you get out of that salvage needs to be worth more than 60 copper. So you have to look at it in that respect. Now, masterwork items, green items, typically have sigils and have... Uh, other various things attached to them. When you salvage them, you're going to get the chance of getting those. So you have to look at those sigils. You can see what kind of sigil is on it. You know, yeah. the 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 suffix of every name of every item is uh, will tell you you know what kind of sigil is on it. Or you can just highlight it. If you look at that sigil, you can search for it and see that the sigil of the berserker, for example, or of the mesmer, is selling on the marketplace for 75 copper a piece. Well, that tells you right there, Bridger, that it is worth it to use a master you know salvage kit to get that particular thing just for the sigil alone now, now it's still a chance to get the sigil right isn't it like a 40 percent chance to recover right. it so you have to kind right. of factor that in too but now here's a question i'm at. i i didn't test and i really wish i did if i've got let's say uh, a masterwork uh tier three item right so something that was made in the 25 to 35 ish range uh if i use like the first tier salvaging kit to salvage it, will I actually get tier three crafting materials or will I only get copper? Like, will I get, what is it, uh, the one that comes after iron? Is it uh, gold? Will I get gold or whatever out of it or will I get just copper because I'm using a low tier salvaging kit? Well, it, the salvage kits are, they all work the same way as far as basic materials. At least okay, that's what so I've the noticed. percent chance on there only are like special materials is because I know what you when you hover over the salvage kit it says percent chance to recover higher level materials and then it also says percent chance to recover sigils and runes or something like there's two right. percent chance and I, I was never sure exactly what those meant yeah um, you know I, I've noticed uh, and this is just my personal experience and I'm sure you know it, it the variables may say a little bit different but I notice that with like basic items we'll say blue items um, what do you call it the rare items right um, typically, if you say if you salvage them with a like a crude salvage kit, you're going to get roughly the same ore and the same basic materials as you would if you were using a master salvage kit. Okay. My rule of thumb, if I had to create a little mini guide, the rule of thumb for for anybody is 
if it's rare or if it's exotic, use a master salvage kit. There's no reason not to. Matter of fact, if you can, use one of those Mystic salvage kit, the the best ones. I forget the name of it. Yeah, them. it's Mystic. I think it's a Mystic yeah. salvage kit. It's the one that you can get at the Mystic, uh, yes. the, the, the not the Mystic Forge, the, the gem store that always 100% of the time will will get you your sigil or rune out of the the piece of armor. That's like if you have, you know, a piece of armor that you have and for whatever reason you don't want to transmute it, you just want the rune out of it to put in something else. The way the only way to guarantee 100% that you'll get that rune back is with one of those mystics salvage kits that you can get at the gem store. Right. And those are going to be, you know, something that's going to be one of the items that everybody's going to want. Because when you get like the highest tier exotic items and you put a two gold sigil in them, or whatever cost they will be, you know, there you're not you want to be you're going to want to make sure that you get you know your investment back. So, okay, so uh, let's let's talk level eighty and just a little bit of speculation here. We're, nothing is really certain, but uh, Kai, what do you think is going to be the most valuable things? to, let's say you want to make money at level 80. What's the most valuable thing you can farm? Is it dyes, crafting materials, exotic weapons? I mean, should you craft things in order to, to farm it? Just some some off the blue speculation. What do you think? Um, I think it'll be the crafting materials for exotic gear and weapons, the things that you need. Um, I'm not 100% sure on the names of them, but we've all seen a couple of pictures uh, on you know, various wikis and things of things that you need for the legendary weapons. And I assume that it'll be the same for exotic weapons and gear as well. So I think they're the things that will be the most expensive. Any food, like buff foods that you need, any of the you know the high-end things for that, when people might need a PvP or dungeon runs, there are guilds who require you to have certain foods and potions. I know that, I think it's... <laughs> you cannot it, enter this dungeon with us unless yeah. you have a cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> And I think they'll be really expensive as well. I think it'll be quite like WoW. I think the things that make the best crafting gear will be expensive, and the things that provide the best buffs, the best gems, the best runes, they'll all be expensive as well. I think it'll be the same. Okay, so uh, let's see. Freelancer, do you have any different opinion? I think it's probably going to be legendary stuff, right? I would imagine. Mm, no. No? I, I, no, I, I, I wholeheartedly believe that those who control the dye markets, those that control the cosmetic markets... Those that control the, the, you know, anything extraneous that is typically that you wouldn't be looking for are those that are going to be rolling the, the markets, period. I mean, obviously, legendaries are a big part. Team Legacy is going to have dedicated people to max out certain professions so that we can start popping out legendaries nonstop. You know, and I believe I heard on Reddit. <laughs> Miane, get back in the forge. You can't play instruction PvP <laughs> until you churn out another three dozen. Well, you know, we have we have like a flowing system. You know, I, I bring in the, the goods. I send them to people that craft them and actually have the time to craft them. They craft the particular items that we're going to need. You know, we've heard some speculation on what those items are going to be, but we know that some of these items require max level, you know, crafting and different things. So, um, you know, and then those people work together and create legendaries. We put them up for 2,000 gold, sell, bam, work on the next one. You know, we want to get this to a method where we're buying enough material and we're, we're manipulating the, the high tier market enough where we can pump out more and more legendaries. Because we go back to early, early Tales of Tyria. You remember what I said about players in general when it comes to the best in the game? You remember that? They are lazy. Ah. So, yeah, so <laughs> where you will make the most money in, in the long run is not only just legendaries and selling them to players that don't want to spend the time to try to get their legendary, you know, they just want to buy it. Um, or do we know yet if legendaries are tradable? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating. I have I no idea. We're I wouldn't pretty think so. I sure. think it would be silly. Yeah, my best guess, based on what they've said, is that the cra- materials that you have to craft. You need crafting in up to 402 locations, and then you can craft things. So the materials that you need okay. in order are to tradable. craft are probably tradable. But once you crafted that thing, it's probably a count or, or uh, character bound once you've crafted yeah. it. So I'm I don't pretty sure think you make you can... it in the Mystic Forge, I think. Like, so you put all the materials, you bet yeah, the materials. Yeah, the legendary is in the Mystic more. Forge, definitely. Yeah. And then but, you put them in, and then you get the legendary, and I think that's when it's found, yeah. when you make it. But I think that the you are basically going to require to have your character get 400 in these two things. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you literally can't have the legendary. I think that's the idea, but we'll have okay. to wait and see. Well, let's put legendaries aside, because I, I don't foresee that as being the largest source of income for players. What I see for players, those especially that are min-maxing and getting to level 80 really fast, is... 
typically like the dye markets. Um, you know, you remember how many dyes you saw that image, Bridger? Oh, the yeah, one I, that you, I had you every, I had almost every dye in the game at the end of BW3. Um, and I made it a point to consistently. Now, did them, but you not, just do that by buying uh, from the gem store? Or no, no, you, no. For um, for buying by manipulating by buying buying off the market on, off the market, right? Ah. But the the reason I did it though, Bridger, was a sort of like a research test because that's something unique. Like I never had to deal with in in WoW and Aeon and Warhammer, for example. In those um, in in Guild Wars two, typically uh, players, you know, this whole die concept. They're in the beginning. The the idea in the beginning is that most players are going to sell their unidentified die in order to uh, you know, get some quick money. That's the idea. So who's going to buy all of this unidentified die? You know, you, we were mentioning earlier, buy low, sell high. Well, this is one of the reasons that I say quite the opposite. Um, this is where it didn't matter. About it because I wanted to see that by the end of BWE3, BWE3, if players that realized they had a bunch of excess money, if they wanted to waste their time buying die. I, I I like to theorize, and it is just a theory, and I, I make a lot of these, is that by the end of the fact that somebody gets level 80, they get all of their exotics, they get the type of gear they want, you know, which isn't going to be too hard. Most people are going to be able to get that relatively easy. This is Guild Wars, you know. Um, that they will start spending mass amounts of money to get the die that they want. Mm -hmm. Now, that tells me that mass amounts of money means it, it really doesn't matter what the current price is. They have nothing else to spend their money on, Bridger. So what else do, What else becomes a gold sink at that point? You could say world versus world you know, to a certain extent, but on the individual player basis or the RPers or the PBE player, there is no gold sink. You know, there isn't. You know, we talked about this a few episodes ago, but as far as, as, far as we know, beyond world v. world, there is not a real gold sink. So the prices of die, whereas people are trying to sell them, you know, in mass really early on in order to make quick money, people that buy those die up and don't actually, you know, activate them and, and claim them like I did, people that buy those die up, that is a long-term investment where you will make multiple amounts of your original investment. Uh, you, you'll make multiple, you know, mass amounts of dividends. So you're saying often. once people hit 80 and they're like, okay, now I got the gear that I like, now I gotta make it look the way I want to, and well, at that point, they're gonna start buying up the dyes, and that's when the dye market is going to get way more expensive, because at the beginning, of it is thrown on there, people are like, I don't know what I want, they're not buying dyes at the beginning of the mm -hmm. game, but when they hit level 80, then they're gonna start looking into it. Yeah, but you know, it's not just necessarily level 80, it's, it's when, that, the, when the player makes the conscious decision to, I, I wanna get that die, I want that midnight fire die, you know, and they make that conscious decision, they are going to spend a lot of money in that next 24 hours trying to get that die. Now, it is literally like going to a casino. This die market, the way I was trying to work it, was so frustrating because oh. you would have players that bought, you know, mass amounts of gems, converted it to gold. You know, they realized that buying their gear only costed them 14 silver. Now, what are they going to do with all of that money? So I, I had to deal with players that, unfortunately, you know, BWE3, there's no way to avoid it, that spent all of their money on gems and, and, and did that, you know, then mass bought dies because there wasn't anything else to buy. Mini pets is another market. You know, mini pets is similar to dies. I was bringing up cosmetics was a market that I, that I tried my best to see if I can at least break even on. Like I had spreadsheets on, this is how much money I'm putting in the dies. This is how much money I'm putting in the mini pets. Let's see what happens by the end of BW3. Mini pets did very well. You'd be surprised how many players will waste money on a particular looking mini pet. Um, like they, they don't, they don't put any thought into it. Most players, know they have a certain mini pet that they want following them around. They know exactly what they want with it, and they will spend two gold in order to buy it. I was selling mini pets consistently for two gold. Now, tip number three, gold makers. I have this on my own little uh, show notes here. If you want to make money, this is a, a, a freelancer way of making money. This A lot of people ask me, there's no way you made all that money yourself. You must have bought it with all gems. No, this is actually how I made most of my money. Now, we all know about you can convert gold to gems, right, Bridger? Yeah. So the typical exchange rate for gold during BWE3 was about uh, like three gold could get you enough gems, which was 200 or 300 gems, to buy a three mini pet pack, okay? Mm -hmm. So what I, what I was consistently doing, and I was, I was watching it like a hawk, <laughs> is watching where the gold price was, how many gems it would get me, and whether 
three gems could get me 300 or three gold could get me at least 300 gems or four gold. Now the idea of Ridger is that you want to be able to turn around and sell those mini pets for profit. Mm -hmm. All right. So when I buy that mini pet thing, so I bet, all right, let's step by step. I, I spend four gold. I get 300 something gems or right around, um, you know, 300, just enough to buy that mini pet pack. Okay. Well, that gets me three mini pets. Now I have the chance of getting like a rare one or something like that, but typically mini pets sold for about 50 silver to 75 silver uh, at all times. So those, uh, those mini pets, you put them up on the market and you try to break even, but there was always the chance and you bank on this, that you're going to get one of those rare ones. Okay. That you're going to get one of the yellow named ones like Logan or, or, you know, anything like that. Logan is a mini pet. Yes, he is. Oh, and, kill me now. You know, and there's, you can search the mini pets and see them on the listing. Like, I never actually got one, but you could see them. You could go mm -hmm. through all the mini pets at all times. Plus, you can look at your bank and, you know, highlight all the empty spots you don't have yet. So, the the way I was making a lot of the money is I, any time that the market gave me the chance, the gym market gave me the chance to spend just enough money to make money off of mini pets, I would buy gems, turn around, exchange them for three mini pets, sell those mini pets on the market, and make a profit from that. And then so there's normally you make just a small profit, but you're banking on the chance that every once in a while you're going to make a huge profit from the, the rare one that pops out. I, well, the idea is that I would normally break even. You know, that's that's the thing. I'd play it safe. So if, if it's costed three gold and then I sold each of those mini pets for, for one gold each, then I was breaking even. Actually, normally it was less than that. I could spend like two gold and get 300 gems. But the idea right there is to spend that amount of money and then flip it around. So... There's, again, like you said, there's always that chance I got a yellow one or I got a green one. And, that, you know, it seemed to me like when I was looking at my sell orders and buy orders, that didn't mean anything at all. What it really meant is how cute the thing was. You know, so <laughs> here I was with a spreadsheet trying to judge, you know, the, the prices of gems versus, you know, whether I get three mini pets and I can sell them. But what, what I started noticing on my sell orders is that it didn't matter if they were yellow. It didn't matter if they were green or blue. It mattered how cute they were. You know, how, how small they were, okay? And I started noticing that certain particular mini pets um, that were not rare, that were not yellow, where I could list them for four gold apiece, okay? I listed a, uh, a small polar bear, Bridger, uh, oh, and I, I, ended up bear? Getting a small, I ended up getting about five of these. I listed them for 10 gold apiece, sold every single one of them within one hour. Wow. And that opened my <laughs> right, eyes. I'm going to be playing the mini pet market a little bit, maybe. I'm never... Putting a stupid. So line, you know, this is just this is just mini pets. I did the same thing with uh, with dies. Basically, looking at the cost of spending some gold for just enough gems to buy three dies, which are guaranteed to get you know one I think rare die, right? Yeah. So the the rare die, same thing applies, Bridger. You know, most people when they look at rare die, they see the yellow name, they don't think much of it. But when you get a black die, or when you get a pure <laughs> white die, yeah. or something, I sold a black die for fifteen gold. Yeah. You know? And that black die came out of a, I think it was a 300 gem, you know, item off of the, the gem store that I spent about two and a half gold for. So right there, Bridger, I took two and a half gold, turned it into 15 gold, plus the other two dies that I got out of that. I, I don't even remember what they sold for. That's just like fluff, you know? Right. And I did this in mass quantities. You know, I, I'm saying it one at a time, but this is, the, this is what players can work themselves up to. This is what I enjoy doing. So I did this with mini pets and, and dies and stuff, and that was just those two markets. And I, and I also obviously did a lot of other things with our markets. So let's move on. <laughs> right. All right. So uh, let's, let's sort of go back a little bit to the buy and sell order system because this is something that's new to a lot of players. And we did talk a little bit about it, and I talked about it in the economy video. But uh, uh, Kai, are, are you familiar with this, how the system works? Do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, um, so basically, if you're like, I want to buy copper, and you look on the copper and see that it's all selling for 20 gold each, because freelance has gone on a mass copper <laughs> page, bought it all, putting it up really expensive, you can be like, wait, I only really want to buy it at 10 gold each, uh, 10 copper each or whatever. So you can put that up and say, I'm going to max buy it at 10 copper, you can list it, and then when it's for sale, someone can just go on there and be like, yep, I'll sell it to you. So it's kind of like... I don't know. How can you describe it? It's kind of like you say, I will max pay this much. If someone who wants to sell it really fast can be like, yep, I'll sell it to you for that much. Or that they can put it as a sale listing at a higher price if they want more money for it. I think that's the easiest way to describe it. So if someone wants to sell something really quickly, they can sell it to people who have got, you know, buy orders. And if someone wants to buy something really quickly, they can sell it, buy it off people who have got 
set orders. Basically, Make sense? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The the biggest tip that I can give to anybody who's playing the game that just wants to, you know, avoid, you know, losing money for the what's the least effort that I can do to make the most money for my character? I don't want to spend hours at the auction house. I don't want to do this. Just give me this the the shortest amount of time. Okay, here it is. As long as you have a little patience, you will always make more money mm -hmm. or you always spend less money putting up a buy order or a sell order instead of just buying or selling from whatever's on the auction on the trading post basically if like she said if if the if the copper's going for an absurd rate but the maximum buy order is way lower you could just put up a buy order that's a little bit higher than the other guy's buy order like 21 copper instead of his 20 and then just wait and come back later and if you can have yeah. that patience you will you will lose way less money than if you're just buying i got to buy it now i got to buy it now that's that's the the smallest simplest thing that i can say so now, that's that's great for somebody that's crafting for themselves but what about somebody trying to make money you don't do that um this was actually going right, to be right, like... Right. That's what I'm this, saying. That's why I put okay. the, the sort of caveat on there. This is somebody who okay. just wants the barest minimum. Yeah. What can I do to avoid losing money and or gain right. more money when the, I'm on the auction house? We'll I'm go into it later, but the, yeah, we'll go into it later, but the biggest mistake a player can make is trying to list their buy order for one or two copper above other players. That's the biggest mistake they'll make. They'll never make any money, and I'm the guy that manipulates them. So it's... And, and I can, I'll, we'll go into that, I guess, a little later, but you don't ever want to be that guy that tries to, you know, it's not undercutting, but you know, it's, it's being the, the next highest buy order because you will, the players like me, I'm, I'm not special. I'm not, you know, a lot, anybody can do what I'm doing, but players like me that are manipulating the markets and taking advantage of players that try to undercut each other are going to take advantage of that. This is, you know, this whole episode, this whole Tales of Terry is an awareness thing, you know, yeah. I've already had some of my guild members on TeamSpeak saying, why are you, why are you telling them this, you know, I have seven people telling me this, so, but it's an awareness thing, because we, we all want a good, good market, we want a fair market, most importantly, um, so I guess, I guess I might as well go into it, right? Yeah, we're, we're about there. I wanted to talk more about the trading posts in this section here and just sort of talk about the, the buy orders and sell orders and what people can do. So you're saying, don't like, I've got a stack of copper I want to sell. I don't really feel like crafting for a while. I just want to get some cash now. Um, and, and you're saying I shouldn't, like, the, let's say the, the buy orders are, are hit at about 20 copper and the sell orders are at about 25, 26 copper. You're saying I shouldn't list it up for 21? What should I do instead? Well, you should be careful about it. Now, there's a difference between just listing it for 21 because you see it, somebody else listing it at 20, and you want to buy it, right? Yeah, so you will list yours at 21 and assume that, you know, any incoming people looking to sell will sell to you. Okay, so we're flipping well, it around here. Now Now I'm trying to buy it. Sorry. So I started this with a stack of copper. Now, okay, let's instead okay. say... Let's, let's role play this. All right, let's, all right. let's role play this. Freelancer role playing, all right? Okay. So <laughs> I, I am a guy, I just looked at the market, and I... I just I need some copper, right, right, Bridger? So I see some some people buying it for they have right. I'm a guy who's got copper. copper. Piece. <laughs> yeah, you have copper, but you're not in this yet. Oh, so. okay, sorry. I was so. just trying to get my <laughs> I was just trying to get into my role. <laughs> so all right, so I, you know I have I, I want some copper. You know I don't know what it is about copper. Right? It's, it's, <laughs> I, I want copper. Copper. So, <laughs> all the <laughs> copper. So I, I see a guy placing a buy order for nine copper. Okay, and. The immediate thought for most players, I'd say easily 90% of the players out there, is that if, if they want copper too, but they don't want to spend the, you know, the, the whatever sell order price is, which could be like 20 copper, they're going to list their buy order for 10 copper apiece. No thought about it. Now, you're the guy, this is where you come in, Bridger, okay, okay. that you have copper. What's my motivation? So, I have so, copper, want money. Okay. Yeah, you have copper, you want money right now. So you're not going to put a sell order up because that would take time, right? You know, and that's also assuming somebody doesn't undercut you, and then you have to wait to get your money. You want to sell right now. Mm -hmm. So you see this market. You see people right now selling for nine or buying it for nine copper a piece immediately, buying for buying it for ten copper a piece, and you want to sell it immediately. You're going to sell to that guy for ten copper a piece, mm -hmm. right? Yep, yeah, yeah, that's me. Now, what we just explained here is a normal market scenario. Now, right there, you might say, "Well, isn't that just pretty much how it always works?" Not at all. If you don't do your research, this is where I step in. Tip number whatever, <laughs> 9,000, okay? Dun, what I, dun, I did dun, dun, on dun. the screen, and it, and it blew minds, um, and I'm using their words, that this is just normal for me, is I would immediately buy 
uh, I would immediately upsell the the sell order, um, or yeah, the the buy order. I'm sorry. If I saw the, like, let's go back to the nine copper. If I saw it for nine copper a piece, and I saw that it was selling currently, sell orders were going for about twenty copper a piece. I would buy all of the sell orders up to a certain amount. Let's say up to thirty copper a piece. So if there was three thousand sell orders there for thirty copper a piece, I would buy them all. Okay. Now you may think like, whoa, well, you know, what did you just do that for? But just follow follow along here. What I would do at that point is list some sell orders, some I'm sorry, some buy orders that stacked up to about twenty eight copper a piece. Now you may think you just lost a, ma- a you know a mass amount of money, but Bridger, what is what do most players do when they need an item and they go in and look at the buy orders? They overshoot it by one copper, right? Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, it just clicked. Wow. So, okay, so you act like a whole bunch of different people in order to put that buy order way up. They don't even look necessarily. You don't have to bu- put a bunch of different things in there. You could just you buy out. You bought it at two, at twenty eight basically. You buy out to say thirty, and then you bring the lowest buy order up to twenty nine, and everybody else says, "Oh well, I'm going to put it at thirty, and then you resell to those people that are just buying. Oh my god. Wow. I mean, that is that is mine one, equals mine. blown. I finally figured it out. Okay. So I'm right so there, I would, Okay, so I'll explain it one more time for everybody watching. This is I, I really dubbed this my tactic because when I got to talking with one of the arena net devs and I got to talking to a lot of these other power traders, they didn't do this. But I'll explain it to you guys. All right. So take on, let me let me get open let me open like a Photoshop and maybe I can try and like graph it. <laughs> no, go ahead. All right, I'm gonna try to explain this simpler one more time for everybody. This is. I, I'm saying this because I really, you know, I should not be able to do this, and people should not be able to manipulate. And maybe Arena Net will create a way where I don't make massive amounts of money, massive amounts of money. But this is how it works. Freelancer looks at the market and sees that there is sell orders going for about twenty copper <laughs> piece, and there are buy orders. For <laughs> I'm trying to. I'm trying to visualize it for people. Hang on. Okay. okay so market. I'm, I'm, all right. So let me continue. So what I essentially do in order to make money, and I do this during my downtime in between World v. World, is I will artificially boost the market to a certain point that is, that is above the median level of money. So if I know via my spreadsheets or just via the in-game, there's something that tells you the median price. If I know that copper will always usually settle around 13 copper a piece, okay, let, let's, let's pretend that, okay? okay? The average price of copper and in any normal scenario throughout a year is 13 copper a piece, okay? Mm-hmm. I know that if I artificially raise it to 18 copper a piece, that uh, that it's above. I'm losing money in the short term, okay? But what I can rely on is somebody, you know, let's say I have, um, I'm trying to figure out a way, easy way to explain this. It happens for me just naturally. But <laughs> um, what I'll do is I'll expand the sell orders okay, to a certain helping. extent that I, I'll expand the sell orders to a certain extent that I think I can get away with, okay? So if the sell orders are currently going for 20 copper a piece, buy orders are 9 copper a piece, I will, I will basically buy out all the sell orders to 30 copper a piece. So now when you're looking at the market, we'll go step by step, you're looking at buy orders at 9 copper a piece, and sell orders are for some crazy reason all of a sudden 30 copper a piece. Now, if you just viewed the market right then and there, you may think, wow, there, maybe I should buy low and sell high because, look, I could buy at 9 copper a piece and sell it for 30 copper a piece. That's what you want them to do. Okay, <laughs> that's so, what you want them to think. <laughs> all right, so, so uh. you have people putting mass amounts of order, they start looking at the market. They see that there is a big discrepancy between buying it at nine copper a piece and thirty copper a piece, or even higher, depending on what I'm trying to manipulate. So, right there, people are buying it. They're looking at it. At the very least, they're aware of it. If they're looking at the trade post, like, wow, copper it really has a big discrepancy here. Now, at that very moment, it's usually as fast as I can. Um, I will put buy orders nonstop, 10 copper, 11 copper, 13 copper, 17 copper, 20 copper, nonstop up to right under that sell order. Now, when you put it right under that sell order, Bridger, two things happen. One, anybody looking to sell more and and put more sell orders, they're not going to put it because they're like, I'm not making any extra money right now. You know, if you see that if you see that the buy orders are at 29 copper a piece and the sell orders are at 30 copper a piece. You're not going to list more sell orders. Yeah, you're going to lose money because of the transaction fee. Yeah, you're going to think, well, I'm not making any money here. You know, I might as well sell to this guy that's selling it for 29 copper a piece. They stay out of it, okay? 
So you immediately temporarily block them out because they see that the buy order is so close to the sell order, it's not worth selling. They will actually put you know that into their bank and ignore it. Now, at this point, I've brought up the buy order artificially via myself and other guild members and people helping me to a certain point at 27 copper a piece. Now remember, not one, not 30 minutes ago, the average price of copper was selling at 13 copper a piece and I bought mass amounts of it and I had accumulated it over time. Now, what happens is players are gonna go there, they're gonna see the market, they're gonna know I need copper. I, you know, I don't really wanna buy it at 29 a piece, but I need it and I'm not gonna pay that 35 sell order a piece, you know, cause that's six copper a piece. That's outrageous, you know, cause they see that and they don't wanna pay that, you know. So they put up a buy order for 29 copper a piece because that's one copper above my buy order. All right. Mm -hmm. Not knowing that just 30 minutes ago, the buy order was around nine copper a piece. Now I am sitting on 12,000, 20,000 copper <laughs> and I will, and I accumulate this over time, just, at, you know, through different means, whether it's small amount from the guild, but basically just buying mass amounts of it. I basically sit there and when every, whenever somebody lists their buy order for 29 copper a piece, guess who's selling it to them immediately and fulfilling that order. Yeah, so I'm gonna right. I'm gonna try to try to help people visualize it here with an Excel spreadsheet because my paint didn't work very well. So what happens to just being a go and getting gold for free? What's no? that? What, <laughs> what happens to just being a girl and getting gold for free? I don't know. I don't think anything happened to that. I think it still exists. Uh, yeah. so, I'm safe. So to, to try and help people, because there's still some people in the chat room that's saying they're lost. I finally understand what you're saying. So let's say this is the normal copper market. So let's say it looks like this. The sell orders look like this. You, you've got, you're going from top to bottom. So there's somebody willing to sell it for 16. There's somebody willing to sell it for 15. There's somebody willing to sell it for 14. And there's somebody willing to sell it for 13. And these have different numbers. Maybe there's 100 at 13. There's 150 at 14. There's only 15 at, at, at level 15, etc. So these are the different numbers of things. Right now, what freelancer is talking about? Then we'll look at the buy market. Now, this is sort of the natural market without anybody messing with it in large quantities. We're going to have the buy market sitting at about I don't know, let's say nine copper, eight copper, seven copper, six copper, five copper. So to have you guys understand exactly what this means here, what this means is there is let's say two hundred. Uh, entries at nine copper, which means up to 200 uh, individual copper ore uh, can be sold at nine. And then maybe the next level is, I don't know, 500. These are more slightly more realistic numbers uh, because that means somebody's willing to buy up to 200 copper at nine and the next person down, if that, that 200 at nine sells, suddenly that's gone and the next cheapest one that you can buy from or sorry that you that you can sell to because these are buy orders meaning these are people willing to pay this much for this much copper so the next cheapest one you can sell to or the, that, not the next cheapest because you want to sell to the highest the next highest you can sell to is this buy one so what freelancer does is he buys out all of this so that we're now at a situation where copper is up around 30 because he's bought everything over everything below from like 13 all the way up to 30. Now, what he'll do is he'll put, just for the sake of argument here, uh, he will, we're gonna, we're gonna zoom this up. So uh, we'll, we'll take this and move it down a little bit. Uh, so he, so he now uh, puts something in at 15 here, and then he puts another thing at 19, and he has somebody else put something at, tw you know, uh, 20 here. So it looks kind of natural progression, and somebody else put something at 25. And by the time we get to the, t to the top here, uh, now, this is his last thing. He puts in 28, and this is what the market looks like. So, putting in these buy orders, but these buy orders, I assume, might only be 10 here and 50 here, 20 here. Now, he's not necessarily... Um, uh, buying at these prices is, is quote unquote bad, but theoretically freelancer, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, so you're buying less with this inflated price. And the idea is to sell back. Yeah, everything. I'll list each of those for maybe 100 each because they're, I don't ever actually expect people to sell to them. Right. You know, it, it's, and you're probably going to pull I, them down later anyway. Nobody's going to sell to those. After I'm done and it's time for world be world, I pull everything down and all of a sudden as quickly as the market shot up to 30, 40, 50, it goes right back down to about the average. You can always expect it to go down to the median amount because of supply and demand. Okay. This so is this is completely freelancer artificial market. This is, you know, for a time being, as long as I can control it. Now, it involves a lot of refreshing. It involves a lot of people that are, you know, not sure what the heck's going on. 
but it, it's it's a very real thing, and and this is in real life. It's, this people do this. In real I life. just want to finish um, the the example here. So hopefully everybody in the chat room is okay, getting this now. So now this is what he's done in so far as simply inflating this buy price with these smaller things. So now somebody goes here and says, well, I'm not going to sell, you know, to 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 this guy for, you know, I, I, well they're going to try to try to try to sell to this. But the next guy says, well, I can get a lot more uh, if I just put a 29 here, and now the people that are doing this. There may be a whole bunch of actual people doing this, trying to yes, make a buck yeah. because they see, wow, the copper market just exploded. I'm going to try, you know, but I need copper right now. I'm certainly not going to buy from these guys who are selling at 36. They don't know that it's normally cheaper. So they come here and they, they put a sell order for 29. Oh, it's when it. It's the people that put the sell order in for 29. Those are the suckers, essentially, in this example. <laughs> That freelancer then goes and sells this back to. No, but that's. I mean, it's 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 a it's sort of a negative term, but that's that's in, in this example. So that's what they the are. The idea of this, and and you heard it from from me, guys, um, is I buy high and sell even higher. I will buy a top price and sell it even higher. Now, this is only one thing I do. You guys heard about the mini pets. That you know, this is. <laughs> I have a whole other thing, but I don't think we're having enough time. This this is one of. I have about six different things I go down and do. This is one of them. Um, many pets. How do you, you know, even guys. have time to play the game? <laughs> Dude, seriously. If you remember, Kai, because you made a joke about it, I was level three until Sunday morning. Um, yeah. Like I really was. Like I was like, "What are you doing? Just standing." I had people. I had people in my stream like, you know, WTF freelancer. You know, what are you doing? Your guild's out world be world. I got to test this. <laughs> Gotta, this is important. I had to get the information for my spreadsheet so that I could compare BW one, two, and three to see how you know a typical mass volume is going to work. Um, somebody brought uh, brought up in chat very very good point, and that is well this won't work because more volume you know means that you won't you know you won't be able to do it for whatever reason. But Bridger, you know let's let's both think about this. If more and more people are trying to overshoot my buy order by one, does that just not mean my job goes by that much quicker? It's you know? true. Because so the, the, the key point here is that uh, what I was doing and what you ruined in Beta Weekend 2, I was like, I was on the market. I'm like, all right, I'm making some decent money here. Like, I'm no freelancer, but I spent a little bit of time here. I was, uh, I found out there was a big discrepancy in tiny totems, if I recall the situation. Like, the sell orders were way up here and the buy orders were way down here. And so I, I, I bought some of the, I, I put a buy order really low. The stuff came in and then I relisted it for higher. And then I came down to the thing and I was like, freelancer just unloaded 2,000 of these. Now I, I now I just crashed the market. I'll never sell all this stuff I just bought. You jerk. So um so so the the, the key here is people like me in that example. Uh, that's not exactly the same example, but people like me were looking for this gap, the gap of more than two copper between something, or maybe at least be, be a certain percentage, but. Yeah. A decent gap between the sell and the buy order. Because, uh, as they say, nature abhors a vacuum. And so in this kind of a thing, people will try to put out a buy order for the 29, yep. expecting to relist it for 35 when they get the chance. And, and I noticed the trend uh, going exactly what you're saying, Bridger, was correct. If I if I made sure that that gap was even wider, like if I, if I consistently made sure that there was a 15 copper difference or a 20 copper difference... I noticed that I had even a higher volume of people trying to put up uh, buy orders to overshoot my buy order, which is a good thing because here I am sitting on 17,000 iron ore and I have to get rid of it. You know, I'm not right. making money with it sitting in my bag, in my bag. So, um, you know, I had, there was times when I had like, you know, 16, you know, 17,000 of a certain ore. And, you know, at that point, you know, I'm running back and forth to the bank because I can't hold it all in my own bags. And, <laughs> but, you I know, I have to get rid out. of that. And the easiest way to get rid of that is to make that adjustment to say, okay, maybe I don't want to make 15 copper off of each of these. Maybe if I widen the window, lower that, basically take off some of my buy orders and lower it to a, you know, 11 copper, 12 copper, um, then, you know, more people will list theirs for 13, 14 copper and I can sell to them. And it actually worked like that. So, so, yeah, so the goes, key here is place. that the people that expect to make a quick buck because they're looking at
And they're like, oh, well, or the 28, they say, I put it at 29, I relisted at 35, but by the time you sell all your stuff to the people that are at 29 and 30, the market is going to be crashed by those same people back down towards the 13. So there they are go. not going to make the money. I, I always get asked, and, and this is where I've come out and told everybody how I do this and how I make all of my money. In BWE1, you know, I made about 200 gold by, uh, nearly by myself. In BWE2, I had the help of the guild. I made 600 gold. We did gold. We did March of the Golems and all that other nonsense. In BWE3, we got about 80 gold, 60 to 80 gold worth of gems from guild members. And then we had, um, you know, I turned that into another 600 gold or so. You know, there are players out there like myself that are, that have these tactics. And these are not just things that I fabricate. These are real world economics. Um, okay, this, so this happens in stock market. What I'm trying to say, Bridger, is that you just have to be smart about what you're buying. This is an awareness thing. I'm I was trying just going to gonna ask you, talk. how do you defend yourself against this? That's that, Yeah, that's the whole point of this, of me explaining this. To defend yourself from this, you have to be smart about what you're buying. Don't be the impulse buyer that goes up there and sees that opportunistic moment. You know, that That's pretty much what a lot of MMOs have, is those shameful opportunists, opportunists that will see see that differential and, and buy and sell order, and they'll immediately try to, you know, you know make a quick buck. And I get asked all the time in game, well, how do you fight off other people? What do you mean that you're not worried about other people that are trying to monopolize the markets? Well, it's because I'm manipulating those people. <laughs> you know, the more people that try to try to make a quick buck off of players that don't deserve it, you know, are the is exactly the the people that I make my money off of, and I make them go bankrupt. So I'll give you an example, Bridger, and this this is going into probably something a little controversial, but I wholeheartedly believe in it. Typically, the people that are looking to buy really low and sell really high for a quick buck have no consideration for the average player that does not have the money to to do that. You know, they are looking to buy it low and sell it somewhere obscenely high, so people can't necessarily afford it unless they somehow came across money. This what, what this does is those players that typically bought their copper for thirteen copper a piece, they don't get affected. This all happens within a, a thirty minute to one hour cycle. Mm -hmm. If they did, if they barely had the money to buy it at thirteen copper a piece, if that was a decision they had to make, they're not going to even touch the market when they see it at thirty copper a piece. So they're for the most part they're unaffected. Now the people that do jump in are the opportunists. They see this is a fifteen copper differential. I need to jump in on this. And they fully expect not to use this, but to turn around and sell it at, at a really high price to somebody that probably doesn't know any better. These people, they end up losing money in mass amounts because whereas they didn't know it was going for 13 copper a piece, they are now, you know, being, they're paying, the, you know, when you put a buy order bridge, you're essentially paying for something, you know, so they're paying 29 copper a piece out of their greed to me. You know, and, and in that case, what I'll do is at that point, I, if you watch the stream, my Twitch stream, you'll see it. I do it multiple times in between World and World. At that point, Bridger, I make it a, a like a will call decision to say, okay, this has gone on a little too long, usually 30, 45 minutes, I'll pull out. I pull everything out. I immediately drop all of my, my buy orders. It drops back down to nine, whatever copper it is. This is just copper. So I, hang I on a second, hang on a second. What you're saying is... You rob from the rich and not the poor. Is yeah. that what we're talking about? Yeah. Because somebody in the it, chat room just dubbed you Robin Hood. Like you turned from the evil <laughs> empire into Robin Hood in one fell swoop <laughs> from it. Don't worry, I only steal from the greedy. Because <laughs> again, think about it. This is taking advantage of the players that are trying to make a quick buck. You know, this is the people that I'm catering to, the ones that see that price difference and they're trying to say, ooh, I can really, you know, make some quick money and, and then turn around and sell it to players for much higher than than what I remember it being, because they see, oh my God, 35 copper a piece, are you kidding me? You know, and so they're thinking, man, if I could sell that to average players for 35 copper a piece, I'll make a killing. They're not thinking about the well-being of those players that probably don't have 35 copper a piece. They're just thinking money, 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 cha-ching. So that, when I pull back out, the, the thing about volume, and this is the great thing about being a global market, is the volume will reset itself within an hour easily. I've seen it go faster than 30 minutes, where players will typically, uh, you know, you'll see the buy orders, you know, for nine copper a piece. I will make it a, a very strong point to continue putting sell orders, like I did with the buy orders, Bridger, mm -hmm. all the way down to about 12, 13 copper. I do that with the last remaining 500 to 1,000. Uh, of a material I have, that <laughs> that immediately resets it. And if you if you Bridger were doing World v World during 
like before and then after, you would have had no idea just how much it fluctuated. And uh, you know, unless of course there was a nice graph in there to tell us, which may or may not be coming <laughs> soon. Like I keep seeing in the bottom corner, they're like market details coming soon. And I thought I remember seeing a graph in the first beta weekend, but it never came back. Like that's what we need because that's what will basically arm the uninformed player when they go to the market. They need to know. Okay, is the current market? A reflection of what the actual market pl- price is, or is this just is this market that I'm looking at here? Is this all uh, sort of hieroglyphics for freelancer was here? Like, is that what I'm yeah. actually looking at here? So, and none of us are safe because it's global, so n- none of us will escape the wrath of freelancer. Yes, <laughs> that's right. So, uh, so that's certainly a, a this, thing. This to is know. an awareness thing, though, Bridger. It's really important to keep re- reinstating the fact that. If players would not be greedy, if if they would go out there and just, you know, I do this in real life. Just do this be patient life, is more important extent. than anything exactly. else. Be, Look be at the patient. market and then come back an hour later. And if it's fluctuated, then that gives you some information. And come back an hour later. If it's fluctuated again, that gives you some more information. Well, Wait until you get a good idea. This is to, you know, get arena net to add more tools to judge these things. But like in previous games and WoW, for example, all of us had auctioneer. Well, guess what? I don't yeah. know how many people actually looked at all those fancy, um, you know, fancy auctioneer tabs. Most people just used auctioneer to list all of their items at once. I mean, come on, that's what most of us did, right? Yeah. Auctioneer went to this extent. It, it did this automatically. It judged. You could scan the market basically for slash. Uh, scan, auctioneer, everybody had their own command spending on version. I used to log on once in the morning before I went to class when I was in college and, and just scan, to right? scan the market and just to keep it up to yeah. date so that I would get so the good thing. So that way you knew, Bridger, that when you signed on later that you would not be paying, like if you needed to buy something, you wouldn't be, you would know what the average price was. Right. Now, ArenaNet, getting off of the whole freelancer thing, the ArenaNet has the median prices and stuff. That That idea, I think they're trying to implement that already. I noticed the section or I think I've seen a screenshot I think one of the BWEs that actually worked as well. I'm pretty sure it worked in BWE one, but I didn't see it in two or three. I know exactly. What exactly, you're talking I didn't about. either. And, and like with the gem store, you see it. You know, you see yeah. that crap. What they really need to do, and you know, maybe they can't do it because of server load or whatever it might be. But what would prevent all of this? Because nobody should be able to do this and, and manipulate. It. You got to have first off, you got to have buying power. You know, you you have to have the backing of a guild like Team Legacy or or just another big guild that is super super supportive of. But, you know, my, my guild members know what I can do with markets. This is not my first rodeo. I did the similar with WoW, Aeon, et cetera. So the, you got to have the backing and the buying power to do this sort of thing. But even with that, nobody should be able to do this. You know, you, everybody in a perfect market, which there really is no such thing, but in a near-perfect market, Bridger, mm-hmm. all buy orders would be right at the sell orders, you know, nearly at all times. Right. So that that is an ideal market. I would love if the markets for every single item were like that. But it's just not going to happen like that. Um, so it, it will probably be easier the more players are there because the market will reset even faster than what you're talking about. If even if any shenanigans happen, there will be less time for you to, to to take advantage of that. I would guess. All right. So, but we're kind of running long, so I want to move on. Okay. That was a really fascinating discussion on that particular aspect of it. So let's jump into the last couple things I want to talk about. So um, let's talk about gems. And let's talk about, okay, if you want to afford, I don't know, that specific die that you're looking for or the legendary item you need to buy some materials off or you're trying to get a new crafting discipline up. For whatever reason, you need gold. What is the best way to get it? There are a lot of different ways to get it, but one of the things I want to talk about very briefly is the formula that I came up with, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show it to you guys right here. Uh, this is a, I get to do some math too here, Freelancer. This is my time to shine. Now, this is a thought experiment, I should point out. This isn't like actual like market techniques, like you can use this to take advantage of other players, unfortunately. No, uh, this won't get you instant gold. What this will do is allow you to put some numbers, some quantitative things into your subjective idea of should I farm for this or should I buy some gems and sell them for gold? What is worth more to me, my time or my money? And so what this formula is, is uh, basically a thought experiment to help you look at this objective concept. Now, first, I will quickly show you the formula here. It's F times .0125 divided by E. In this case, F is the rate that you can farm gold at level 80 or whatever you're at, wherever you want to make money, if you have to first figure out how much gold can I make in an hour. Then plug that into F. 
then E is the current gem exchange rate in gems per gold. So once you get that, plug that into E, then what that gives you is essentially the equivalent wage you would be making if you farm in game. So let's, to, to make this simpler, let's, let's take an example. So let's take an example where uh, e, W here, uh, sorry, F, the farm rate, let's say you can make 10 gold per hour. Right? This is just an example, hypothetically. You can make 10 gold per hour at level 80. Let's take that as the example. Now, the current gem exchange rate is, let's say, you can get uh, 100 gems for 50 silver, so 0.5 gold. That was about the exchange rate at the end of beta weekend event number 3, right? So if you do the math, uh, 100 divided by 0.5 is actually 200. And 100 gold per, or 10 gold per hour is, is exactly what it should be. So now what we do is we pull up the good old calculator and we do the math here. So we take the, the F here, we take 10, multiply it by 0 0.0125, okay? Then we divide that by 200 and I screwed up the math somewhere. What did I do? <laughs> Welcome as Bridger it's, 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 explodes on air. Like I did all this work at, like, earlier put, in the week and I forgot. 1, 2, 5. It's 0. 0.0125. Aha! 0. 0.0125 times 10 divided by 200. Is that what I want? No. No, no. That's where my mistake is. 100 divided by 0. 0.5 is 200, but I'm doing this backwards. It should be in gold per gems, I think, is where I made the mistake. I did it all on a piece of paper, and as I transcribed it over, I think I got it backwards here. So let's try 0.5 over 100, which is not, in fact, 200. Live on air, <laughs> Bridger corrects his mistakes. All right, 0 0.005. So this is what it should be, gold per gems, which is actually how it is reflected in the game. It is reflected in how much gold you can get for 100 gems or vice versa. So uh, let's see. So now we plug in the numbers. So 10 times 0 0.0125 gives us 0 0.125. Then we divide that by 0 0.005. There we go. What we get is $25 per hour is the equivalent now uh, there is a small exchange rate when you when you exchange gems you do lose a little bit of it it's kind of insignificant in the total amount so essentially what this means is based on the current exchange rate and the current rate of farm that you can make uh, it would be equivalent to your farming would be equivalent to working for $25 an hour and then converting that into gems. Now this example, it's, it's, you know, farming is really lucrative. I don't expect it to work out like this. This is a hypothetical situation. I made up the whole farming rate and the whole gem exchange rate. My guess is that this formula is often going to give you a number somewhere around minimum wage, maybe a little less even, because I would guess that people are willing to work for less than minimum wage because farming in the game is more fun than an actual job. Uh, so that is my guess, is that what we'll see is the W here is probably going to wind up being around $6 an hour, or maybe a little bit less than that. That's my, that's my hypothetical and, and, and guess. And I want to make a little comment that, for all of those listening, a uh, little secret, I'll go over it another time, but if, you, if you're at the end of the game, you're looking to spend and make the most money with your time. It's not through gems. It's not through experience. It's not through farming, crafting materials. It is through karma. And ah. we'll, we'll hit that in a whole another point. But you make the most money in-game farming karma. And it's, um, it's because of the fact that ArenaNet has put items in, in the game that you can buy via karma that could be turned around and sold on the auction house. I'll, I'll be really quick with it. I'll give you one example. Oranges. Or, or fruits or uh, pineapples or, or anything. I noticed that in BWE uh, 2 and 3, that it seemed to be like certain fruits. You could not find them naturally in the world. It seemed like if you looked on the auction house and you looked at the Guru database and stuff, that certain things, um, basically you cannot find them in a natural manner. Now, most players don't know how to naturally get those. So then it comes down to, well, how do I get this? Well, if you go to the trading posts, the only players that would be possibly selling them are the ones that knew where to buy them with karma. So that on top of the fact that you can buy, you know, weapons and stuff with karma, you could break down items with karma.
So then it comes down to when we hit level 80 and we're hitting the level 80 zones and getting weapons and stuff for karma, what is the value of breaking down those weapons? Because keep in mind, Bridger, by playing normal, doing public quests, gathering material nodes, okay? Imagine this. Mm -hmm. You are probably participating towards a public event, mm -hmm. okay? You are then going to get karma from that, especially if you're aiming to complete a public event. Or let's talk world v world. Let's talk about hitting supply camps nonstop. Not only are you benefiting yourself over time, but you're getting karma from that, okay? You're getting a little bit amount of money, but you're getting karma. That karma, nobody ever realizes this. And, and I've done the math over and over and over and over. Um, I've used the formula, formula similar to yours and many, many others. Karma can be exchanged for massive amounts of money way beyond what you can get drops, et cetera, for uh, at, a, at what I imagine would be high level gameplay. Even at low level gameplay, by exchanging your karma for items and then breaking them down with master salvage kits and better salvage kits, you actually turn around and make more money than if you had spent the same amount of time just running around gathering crafting material. So I really, I, I don't have a hypothesis on it quite yet. I don't have a theory that I can put out there. I have a seven page document on Google that I'm, I'm actually working on that, you know, that I do this, you know, this is my hobby. <laughs> as pathetic as <laughs> When it I get is, home to relax, I, I go and update my spreadsheets and come right, up with new things. <laughs> you, you heard it here first, but something tells me that the market, the way I'm looking at these numbers and the way I'm, I'm trying to mess with them is that the market's going to be based around things you get from karma and convert into material and therefore convert into, uh, you know, on the auction house. So it, it goes to say also that items that you can only get via karma, which just seemed to me because I didn't see any mobs or hear about any guild members getting low tier fruit and stuff. Uh, it seems to me that also items that you can only get via karma. Most players, it doesn't matter if Guru has a database or who has a database, most players will not know how to get those items except for buying them off the auction. Mm -hmm. I almost did it that trading post. So that tells me right then and there that those will always be demand because Bridger, this is an item that, you know, unlike copper and iron, et cetera, you will never be able you'll to never just come across it. Yeah, you'll never you'll ne you're not going to come across it in wide amounts. As people found out, a lot of the cooking ingredients and actually we read that post a couple of weeks ago about somebody who made all their money in beta weekend number two because they f they found uh, once we finally got into Gendarin Fields, they found the one cooking ingredient that was almost essential to level up cooking within a certain level range. And people were just hitting that level range. So he bought huge amounts of that cooking ingredient off the karma merchant list it on the auction house and it was only available at that one guy now that's probably not gonna be the case when the game comes out they're probably still setting up those loot lists and everything as far as you know where as far as the vendors and what they're selling for all the different cooking materials but if you're gonna get into cooking or if you're gonna get into the auction house it seems to make sense to me to every single time you complete a heart every time you come across any karma vendor if they have cooking ingredients Take a note, just add it to a spreadsheet, add it to a notepad, you know, okay, heart, you know, in the West has strawberries or whatever the, the special thing is because it, there is a very high chance that some of those things are only available on karma vendors. Then you can go back to the trading post and just, oh, okay, let's look up all these things on my list. Wow, one of them is selling for, you know, 50 silver each. And they were only like a bundle for 12 karma. And then you go back to that person, you buy a whole bunch and you can make a ton of money that way. Yep. So the the idea, the, the overview of this entire you know, episode is, you know, there are a lot of things. You know, everybody everybody gives a simple explanation of, oh, buy low, put a low sell or a low buy order, and sell it high. You know, and everybody seems to think that that works, and that does work to a certain extent. But you're not you're not manipulating the volume. Even somebody that doesn't have a lot of money can can. D use that volume that everybody's so afraid of. You know, this is a global market. You'll never be able to make money. You can actually have that work for you. Um, the karma thing, you know, like myself, my my whole BW3 experience was worldly world, worldly world, worldly world. Immediately flip that karma for things that get me karma-related items that I can salvage or that I can sell, like fruit or something. Sell those on the, on the trading post, then immediately go to the, you know, physically to the bank trading post, which, little tidbit for you guys, if you didn't know this already, the best place to do your trading, by all means, is the Borderlands. Because uh, mm -hmm. right then and there, you have your banker right there. 
right next to your <laughs> Did you your just guild fill thing? up the borderlands in every server for like the, the, the first two weeks like, oh i'm gonna do some trading let me go to the borderlands and then people are trying to get in the door like leave What's the funny... borderlands you're afking in the bank what the hell what was funny is like i, I, I... So here I am, like sitting in front of this trading post guy, and I, I was trading, and I'm not paying attention. You know, I have a big window in front of me. I'm streaming, and I'm not paying attention to the chat. And I hear people saying, "Is this guy going to move out with us or not?" <laughs> like, oh, sorry guys. Let me uh, let me turn off this commander icon. I think he's like, like rustling up a party to head out, and he's really just no. I'm going to be here for a while, guys. I got trades to do. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, it uh, kind of makes me wonder: should they get rid of the stuff from from the Borderlands? Because I I don't think you want people sitting there. Maybe just the trading post guys, but no, you want those because it's really I, nice know, the, to be able to go back. Sierra, and, ah. The Sierra Lands, the Radisson, um, the city, which is gorgeous, by the way, mm -hmm. um, has if, if you're not in the Borderlands, if you just can't get there for whatever reason. They have the best, I'd say, like organization with the way their banker and their the trading post and all, and the, even the crafting stations are all lined up. Yeah. My complaint with Lion's Arch and Divinity's Reach, Divinity's Reach is not too bad, but Lion's Arch, it, it seems you got to run, and I do this on my stream anyway, but you have to run across the entire middle. You'll see me using waypoints. I believe on that video you showed, you saw yeah. me using waypoints in order to make it faster. But the ideal situation is you want to be able to quickly maneuver things you to and from your character from the bank and going to the trading post. I would love to see Bridger an option that you can just sell directly from your bank. Would that not be neat? You know, yep. I mean, you can already yeah, sell so. directly from your inventory and buy, so why not be able to just sell directly from your bank? But I understand also that that would break the immersion, you know, and all that other mm -hmm. stuff, so. What do you think, Kai? Kai. Uh, I <laughs> thought, <laughs> so, wake me up. Um, I'd be asked buy from um, buy and sell from my bank. That'd be pretty cool. I think from crafting windows as well. Like if you want to be able to buy more, you can. You can just right click buy more from trading posts. So it kind of makes sense to be able to do it from the bank as well. So yeah, yeah it's just like another that. inventory window. It seems like you should be able to, but maybe there's just, just a coding problem everywhere. that they'll get past eventually. Uh, by the way, somebody was asking where the 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 constant I had in that formula, the point zero one two five. That is the uh, dollar per gem ratio. It's 10 divided by 800. So $10 per 800 gems. And so you would have to put a different constant in there uh, if you were trying to convert for, you know, pounds or for euros, by the way. So this formula, as a thought experiment, remember, is only designed to get you an idea of, well, this is equivalent to working for $6 an hour. Should I maybe just stay an extra hour of overtime at work and then, you know, buy some gems or should I play in game? And you have to factor in and again, subjective, is it fun for me to farm? Is it, am, I, am I farming just by going into world versus world? So I just wanted to throw that out there for people that wanted to customize that formula for themselves. By the way, it is in the show notes if you want to check that out too. So, oh man, I think we covered a lot of stuff. We may not have gotten through everything, but I think uh, we, we covered a lot of stuff. Any final, final comments from either of you guys? No, it's just the same thing. You know, be smart about purchasing. None of none of the supplies that players are smart about what they're buying. If they don't take that, come freelance's friend. <laughs> no, but um, you know, be really smart about what you're buying. I can't stress that enough. I, I would much rather see a market full of smart buyers and sellers than the, the 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 idiots that try to get on there and make a quick buck off of players that don't deserve it. It's true. I didn't put sales tax in the formula. Sorry about that. It's, for U.S., we don't have a whole lot of sales tax. Actually, I don't think we pay sales tax unless you're in Washington. Isn't that how this works? Anyway, um, so <laughs> the last thing that I wanted to throw out there is a quick shout out to the Guild Dark Reavers. Sent us a, a message on the on the feedback there, and they wanted to let everybody know Dark Reavers is a gaming clan focused on Guild Wars 2 that have been around since 1999. That is very impressive, and have been playing games like Counter Strike and Team Fortress, etc. And everyone in the guild is super super excited for Guild Wars 2. It's an English-speaking guild, and most of the members are from England or Ireland, but it's not exclusive at all. Uh, it's a European guild with 100-plus members and is currently recruiting. I always like to see guilds that come from uh, FPS-style games as well, because that's sort of my background, more or less, than, uh, than other MMOs and things like that. So I thought that was really cool. I'll put a link in the show notes there for anybody that wants to check out their website, The Dark Reavers. All right, I think... And, and that last little note, Bridger, mm -hmm. monopolizing the market, which we didn't really hit on, I am 120% against that. I think that people that try to monopolize the market, you know what that is, right? You mean people who buy out the entire market and then list the whole thing way higher? And then sell it way higher in order to try to rip off everybody because they have all of one item. Those people, 
need to get perma banned from Guild Wars. I said it because that is the lowest of low. Ban Hummer. Other yeah. people manipulating the market need to be banned so that my method <laughs> is well, the Well, I mean, no, no trust me. I, I obviously, I'm, I'm sitting I've on heard that broke more. a lot of stuff in WoW for a couple of times. See, obviously, I'm sitting on a lot more money than most. I could do it left and right. I mean, it's so easy to be able to buy out, like, all of one fine material and then list it for 20 times normal price. But is that why? I don't think so. Um, you know, th I was just throwing it out there as a little jab to all the people that think, oh, I got the ultimate strategy. I'm just going to save up money and buy out all of something and then sell it for twice what it's worth. You know, those people make me sick, you know, because they discredit real economists and such that actually do the work and create the spreadsheets and, and try to, you know, do things the, the, I guess, the more moral way. I don't know. Anyways, that's, that's all. That was my little rant. I can't stand people who monopolize things. All right. Well, uh, I guess that kind of uh, does it for the show here. Everybody, thank you guys for tuning in. I know it was another long one. We'll, uh, we'll be shutting it down now. But uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. We really appreciate it. Hope that helped out all of you guys. And uh, have a good one. We'll see you next week. Only three more shows until the release. I can't wait. We're going to do We're still, we're doing, still doing shows after the release. <laughs> just to clarify. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Epic signature. Drawing like, skills. Pro drawing skills <laughs> this is terrible. I've always been like, terrible at art. I'm not the creative <laughs> one. That's not me. <laughs> Somebody said my head hurts, but thanks for all the info. <laughs> it, oh, and then man. you know what's what's funny, Bridget? You and I both know like this this is only like scrapes what I do. Like it's uh, That's why I'm saying we need to we need to start I figured, out I figured I would answer the biggest money makers. You know, everybody yeah. is so quick to jump on that bandwagon like Oh, he just bought a bunch of gems, you know, and yada yada yada, and and they don't understand that they're, you know, I don't know. I guess it's the internet. I mean, it, what well, can you do, right? what what a lot of people don't understand <laughs> is they think you're either using underhanded tactics, you bought gems, or something's broken. What they don't understand is you did spend most of the weekend doing this. It wasn't like, <laughs> well, I yeah, no, I just totally did it. I made tons like, of money. Answer, how are you supposed to lead us when you're level three? <laughs> well, yeah, you probably have a good point there. Let me uh, go out and do some leveling and crafting and stuff. Oh, no, Travi's not going to be able to watch the other shows. He's leaving us. That's okay. I've, I've, uh, the other thing is uh, I think the best way that we can make more money now is that everybody knows how awesome your investment skills are. We need to start a Team Legacy bank, <laughs> and we'll, uh, we'll pay out like 1% interest <laughs> on all, on Faulkner, all storage. Uh, Faulkner, if you actually buy or if you actually trade stocks um, – I can tell you that if you're going to do anything with RIM, short sell it. And if you actually <laughs> trade stock, you know what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Short sell the heck Everything out of I know about the stock market, I learned from Railroad Tycoon, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so You know, I, I played Railroad Tycoon at Sid Mayer's uh, Railroads. Have you ever played that one? Yeah, before? Sid Mayer's Railroads is a little watered down. But, yeah, I played that one, too. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Obviously, I played a ton of EVE, you know, the most um, robust EVE. market I've ever seen mm -hmm. in any game. And I did very well in there, and I cashed out very well in there. Um, so it's, you know, I, I just got, Eve, Eve tends to get repetitive. But um, but you're the kind of player who could pay for their subscription with their uh, market capabilities, their money-making materials then. Oh, you mean hundreds of subscriptions. Yeah, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not hard. In, in Eve, it's not hard. I'm sure Chad will say the same thing. It's not hard to get, uh, you know, enough money to pay for your own subscription. It's not that hard. So but, uh, I think we have to use – now that I have the capability to do custom thumbnails on all the things, I think I need to get a picture of Robin Hood <laughs> and put it as the thumbnail for this one. Or some maybe maybe some kind of uh, like scale. freelancer's scales, head on Just it. freelancer's head. Uh, oh, man. So this is this was a great episode. That was that was awesome. I can't believe that moment when I finally clicked. Like you've been saying this for the past couple episodes. Like, no, no, no. I buy high and then I sell off. I'm like, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. It finally clicked. That was like... I'm still Pfft. confused. I think I'm just going to be poor. <laughs> well, you know, the the average average player, you know we, we, everybody wanted to know how did I make so much money, and that's what this was sort of about. But the average player 
they're they're going to farm their materials. They're going to you know go to those corner spots and get that copper because they're not looking to maximize their time, and that's fine. They're going to make enough money, sell it for thirteen copper a piece, which is decent enough. You figure skill books. How much did the first skill book cost, Brader? Ten like, silver, I think. Ten, ten silver. So yeah, that's that's fair. And most most players are going to get a buy get by just fine. This is not something or anything silly like that. Everybody has to understand. I run a I run Team Legacy. I am, I'm the head of Team Legacy. Team Legacy is a lot of things to me, but it's also I have to be able to support them. I have to be able to support World Be World. When we go out in World Be World, we buy all the upgrades. It doesn't matter who's with us. We spend the money because we know we're in that position. So it, it's a whole lot more to, to me. But it's most like- players, you know, if they need the extra money to buy, I mean, what would you buy extra on the, on the trading post? Not really much, would you? Boxes of fun. So many far <laughs> as the eye can see. Uh, you remember at the end of, uh, well, I don't know if the, the viewers here saw it, but we bought 125 boxes of fun. And <laughs> with our remaining, do you have that image, Bridger, where I bought the gems? That was, that was amazing. So uh, I, if you guys are listening, I bought 18,000 gems with the remainder of my money and bought nothing but boxes of fun. We did everything from epic dodgeball snowball fights. Yep. <laughs> like we, we found a we found a spot in the Sierra Land, you know, where this thing was happening, where we uh, drew lines and we placed five boxes of fun for each round and threw snowballs at each other across these lines. You know, it, it was so much fun. And then we placed like mass. I placed fifty boxes of fun in this in the center area where all the other players were. <laughs> oh, it's it's great. Boxes of fun are kind of crazy. You know, if ArenaNet's listening, I would like to see an item that just gives you snowballs. Like, because I think that's what really makes the boxes of fun. Uh, you fun. know, really, really, yeah, really fun. <laughs> yeah. The fireworks are eh, you know, and, and turning into animals eh. You know, it's kind of like a one trick pony. But those snowballs, man, like <laughs> everybody's running around to get them. Um, they, they need to make like a snowball box or something. And I would buy the heck out of it. But, um, right. Yeah. Good times. I, the average player is going to do fine. It, it's actually podcasts like these and other guides. I'm not the only one out there, you know, that's saying tactics, but there are some really good websites and some guides I came across. So I'll see if I can find them for next show that um, where people talk about things. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it's as long as gamers are smart about it, they they won't get you know manipulated, and everybody will have a good time. Oh man! All right, I'm going to shut down <laughs> everything. Shut yeah. down everything, like I'm Madagascar. I'm going now, and oh, you're going streaming? Yeah. yeah. All the all the I'm people asking, myself. all the people ask. This is post show, right, Bridger? Yeah. Okay, so I could just okay, I could just speak freely. Uh, everybody asking for the spreadsheet and stuff. <laughs> I have to make my money somehow, and <laughs> like, <laughs> so you charge so, for the spreadsheet. Our, <laughs> our, no, we get enough advertising revenue on Team Legacy, but um, you know if. It, you know, I, I can't release my spreadsheet and have everybody know how the trends are working. Well, right, if, you've got all the details there. I think they 